for themselves. Already, our monitors are demonstrating the pollution consequences of using cars for the school run and of keeping our homes warm overnight. Overall, our monitors have revealed that from time to time, there are problems of poor air quality. So Corm's message for the Council, improved monitoring is required if you wish to show the true extent Mr. Miller, you have one minute. of you. West Northamptonshire's air pollution problem. Thank you. That concludes my statement. Thank you very much. I now call Mr John Crick. Again, Mr Crick, you have three minutes. Good evening. I'm speaking to the motion about air pollution also. <clears throat> I'm speaking on behalf of Living Streets Northampton and CTC Northampton. I think we're all aware that Northampton has a serious problem with air pollution that exceeds legal and safe limits in many areas. We know that air pollution especially impacts the most vulnerable causing lung damage in babies and young children and lung and heart disease in older people. The single biggest cause of air pollution in urban areas is motor traffic, with emissions coming not just from the exhaust but also from tyres and brakes. Yet 40% of urban journeys are less than two miles, according to the Department for Transport journeys that could easily be replaced by walking, cycling or wheeling, i.e. active travel. So how do we get people to switch from driving to active travel for their short journeys, for example, to work, to school, to the shops? The answer is to do what cities all over the world are doing, create safe, convenient infrastructure so that active travel is simply more convenient and more pleasant than driving. There's considerable government funding available to the councils that are doing this, and you can see the result in all of our neighbouring cities. The Department for Transport says that active travel should be at the heart of our transport policy. And for councils where it isn't, they will reduce overall highways funding. This was reiterated just this month in the latest Department for Transport guidance. But there's still time to act. We can get started... Thank you, Mr Crick. You have just one minute left. ...by implementing the Billing Road Corridor cycle route from York Road to Park Avenue and Wellingborough Road, for which we received a government grant of £1.3 million. The Council has held back because of worries about public opinion. But let's listen to what the majority want. Last year, the council itself commissioned an independent survey of a random sample of 500 Northampton residents. 60% of them agreed with this statement. Cycling should be given more priority in towns, even if this makes things more difficult for car users. 60% of people in Northampton on an independent survey agreed with that statement. Let's get the Billing Road corridor done. It doesn't even need to be less convenient for car users. There are plenty of alternatives to making Billing Road one way, if only we take time to look at it. Then we can bid for further funding to transform our town into a cleaner, greener, more attractive place and to start to catch up with places like Leicester, Coventry, Nottingham, Oxford, London, Manchester, and all the others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Can I now call? Can I now call and um, Jonah Roy, please? You have three, three minutes, please. Uh, good evening. My name's Anjana Roy. I'm here as member pioneer for the co-op. Um, we pro provide and stock fair trade items, and fair trade is a key policy for us. Um, I'd just like to mention that in 2006, 
Northampton became a fair trade town, mainly because of cross-party support spearheaded by the then councillor, Margaret Pritchard, still a resident in Northampton today. So fair trade is a rich part of our heritage. Fast forward to 2022, and in the intervening 60 years, we've been sleepwalking into a climate change emergency. The wealthiest 10% are responsible for 50% of global emissions, while the lowest 50% by income are responsible for just 10% of global emissions. Fair trade farmers are among the people who have contributed, contributed least to the climate crisis, but are already feeling the worst effects. Across Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, small scale farmers are often ex experiencing the worst ex effects of climate breakdown. They're less likely to earn a living income due to exploitative global change and more likely to rely directly on the land they farm for their life livelihoods. Fair trade standards ensure that small producers take steps to adapt to climate change, reduce greenhouse gases and increase carbon sequestration, avoid deforestation and protect forests, tackle soil erosion and increase soil fertility and reduce water shortage. West North Ants to be in to move forward to becoming a fair trade authority would demonstrate the leadership that our communities need to promote fairness and entrepreneurial action. Not only does this mean putting fair trade in developing one, countries across the world, it also means it also supports the strong spirit of cooperation that West North Ants has in its amazing local businesses, such as the Daily Bed Bread Crop, which supports an extensive fair trade range. I'm aware that this does take up council resource. However, this is a resource for a particular need and a particular uh, need that would not only promote fairness in other parts of the world, but fairness in our, in our communities too. So I'm asking councillors to please support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Zachary Pilkington, please. Now three minutes. Good evening. My name is Zachary Pilkington and I'm here regarding the lack of youth service in the provision of our towns. My personal views is that there are no real areas where young people can go and actually have fun. There are several parks around which is great, but my friends and I don't want to go there and do nothing or just kick a football or a rugby ball around. For example, one of the per parks in my town has a ping pong table, but there is no access to bats or balls unless you buy or bring your own bat. Not everyone can afford to buy lots of different sport or game activity accessories, especially after the pandemic where lots of parents have lost their jobs or have reduced hours. If there was a central base where young people could go and borrow equipment, maybe by using a code from their school or youth association, I think more young people would use the parks some parks don't have a big area for the young people to use, or there is no play equipment around. Most of my friends don't use the swings or climbing frames that the play areas seem to have. We would like somewhere to chill, chat and socialise. I go to a youth club, which is once a week, which, ha which it happens to be a safe place. In the, evenings in, we in the evenings, we have the chance to do all those things. But during the weekends and holidays, my friends and I would like to, not be, able to, like to be able to enjoy the outside. Since the pandemic, we, are, we all appreciate our free time more, and I feel that not having more equipment available to use and keep, keep us entertained is where the chance of boredom can hit, and you get groups of bored young people who can easily be swayed into bad habits, e.g. vaping and drugs. I eventually found a fire in, I actually found a fire in the woods surrounding one of our parks. It was a, it was a small fire, but if my sister and her friends didn't tell me, and I, and I hadn't found it and put it out, it could have easily spread and caused a lot of damage. Luckily, my group of friends haven't gone down this route, but we still got bored of just kicking a ball around. We do, offer, we do have a coffee shop, which has board games available to play freely, but you have to buy a coffee. We'd love to do this outside. It is easy, just, easy to show how some groups fall into the bad habits and cause trouble, Thank just you, because they're bored. Just one minute to go. 
I know my ideas won't solve anything, but I think they would certainly make a big difference as the pandemic has not helped us to socialise easily. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
which are core to West Northamptonshire Council's sustainability strategy. Human-caused climate change is driving global temperature rises currently estimated to reach three degrees or higher. This is having severe and irreversible negative effects on natural and man-made systems worldwide, with the worst impacts being experienced by those who have done least to contribute to the problem. Ecological breakdown is closely linked to climate change. Effectively, the common cause of both is excessive and wasteful human consumption of the resources on our planet by a relatively small proportion of the human population. Our natural environment is changing rapidly and on a very large scale. This is something none of us have experienced before. We must respond to this with similar speed and scale. And in ways I miss Wood, you have one minute to go. Thank you. Thank you. And in ways that are innovative and will often feel uncomfortable. This will mean looking beyond established processes and patterns of behaviour and facing up to some really difficult decisions. The creation of a cross-party sustainability group by this council is a positive step in this direction, but there is a great deal more to be done. The Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill would provide a mechanism for delivering joined up actions across the UK to address climate change and ecological breakdown and provide local authorities with a legislative framework for delivery of the changes needed to improve human health and well-being and support nature recovery. I ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've received no written questions from members of the public. And so we will move on to item six, which is priority opposition motion. Um, under the rules set out within the Constitution, this item is limited to 15 minutes. The mover of the priority opposition motion shall have five minutes to move the motion. The seconder shall have three minutes. A member responding on behalf of the administration shall have five minutes, and the leader of the principal opposition shall have two minutes to reply. No other questions or debate will be allowed. Thank you. I call on Councillor Bob Purser to introduce the motion and um, move the proposal. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Did you notice during the lockdown the clarity of the air around Northampton? It was amazing through Abington Park into the town centre along the River Nen. In the 1950s, I grew up in London, walking to school through the pea super smogs, wards with people with chest problems and many deaths. The Clean Air Act of 1956 sorted that out. My uncle was an environmental health officer dealing with air quality problems along the Thames Estuary, power stations, cement works, paper mills. He spent much of his time in the High Court in London getting objection, injunctions, and the law sorted that out. My interest in this issue came because the Natural History Society's Weather and Climate section installed some air quality monitors at the back of our premises, and we were able to compare it with the official station at Acre Lane. It's good that the Northampton Town Council has also in obtained air quality monitors which it's lending to schools. Many of us will be, have been shocked by the case of the nine-year-old girl, Ella Rudu Kesey Deborah, who lived near the South Circular Road in Lewisham, South London, who died in, nine, in 2013. The coroner remarked that where she lived exceeded legal limits, both EU and national levels for particular levels, which were well above the WHO guidelines. And the issue is it's usually the poorest families that live next to our most polluting roads. What learned in recent years is that the damaging pollutants are not the large particles contained in smoke and dust, but the finer particles particularly those discharged by cars, especially diesel engines. 
The technical name for these particulates are PM10 and PM2.5, and it is the PM2.5 which are the most dangerous, because although they are invisible to the naked eye, they pass into the lungs, into the bloodstream, contributing towards asthma, coronary heart disease, and other health conditions. As I said, these PM2 particles come mainly from motor vehicles and power generation, and there is no safe level for them. All particulates cause harm, and it's about how we manage the risk. Our local background figure for Northampton is 10.41 micrograms per cubic metre, with it reaching 13.92 on the A45. That's double the recommended WHO level of 5 micrograms per cubic metre. We say air quality is a matter of both urgency, is a matter of urgency which we cannot just leave to the government to do. We should be taking local action. And it's important to do that for those most vulnerable to air, for, to air pollution, those living with asthma, other lung conditions, but also babies and young children whose lungs are still developing. But actually all of us will benefit. We know that wherever there is a concentration of traffic, these particulates will accumulate, whether it's a village street, whether with a corner or a hill where lorries and buses need to accelerate. We know there are high levels along the A45, both through Northampton and Daventry. We know there are problems around the bus station and also along Chain Walk by the Barrett Maternity Unit. Thank you, Mr. Purser. Councillor Purser, you have one minute to go. Thank you. So what are the actions we need to take? We need to move to electric vehicles as fast as possible and incentivise the, the adoption of them. We need to get our bus providers to get electric vehicles into the bus fleet. We need our WNC vehicles to go electric, as well as our taxis. We need clear, clean air zones around our schools and health facilities. And when designing traffic schemes, we need to slow down traffic. We need to educate our drivers. As an authority, we need an officer to take the lead to develop a strategy and report annually to this council. And this, of course, links to the climate emergency in terms of our use of, fly, of fossil fuels. And I also commend to you the Oxford Clean Air Charter which I think is excellent. As David Attenborough said today, when receiving his UN Lifetime Environment Award, we know what the problems are, we know how to solve them, all we lack is unified action. As with smog and industrial pollution, air quality is something we can do something about it. And I urge you to support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I invite uh, Councillor Holland Delamere uh, to second the proposal, please. Um, at the time of the first uh, stages of the pandemic, I worked as a key worker on Cliftonville. So uh, when I came in on the bus, very empty bus, into the town centre, it was incredible how different the atmosphere was along the Cliftonville area. The air quality was extraordinary. Being used to um, walking along a polluted footpath um, with the taste of the chemicals in my mouth during the first pandemic, the taste was just wonderful. It's incredible how many vehicles come into our urban centre with just one single occupant. We're not really a very efficient at using our resources because we keep on um, coming into the town centre just in cars designed for five people with just one person. I've also, as a regular bus user, I've noticed over the past uh, few years, even before the pandemic, that um, some of our buses were starting to get older. The new efficient ones were disappearing and we were getting older ones. The irony was um, that um, one of our companies brought some um, buses from London uh, because they were cheaper 
because the actual bus company in London was getting rid of them because of an ultra low emission zone. We really need to be imaginative about how we lead as a council and I welcome the report in Philip Larratt's um, report about fleet management because we've got to lead by example as an authority. We've got to encourage our partners, local transport providers um, to, to really improve the improve the transport arrangements for our town because we cannot continue to pump out all these pollutants into our atmosphere especially when Councillor Holland Delamay you have just one minute to go thank you especially when one of those locations is right next to a maternity unit thank you for um, your time thank you thank you very much um, I'd now like to invite Councillor Colin Morgan to respond on behalf of the administration, please. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you to Councillor Purser and also members of the, uh, the public and the various uh, interesting parties for speaking. Um, it, it's interesting, actually, because um, here we've been at a West Northamptonshire Council um, for obviously more than a year now. And uh, you still see motions coming forward with the words the town centre, which always puzzles me as a, a Daventry representative. <laughs> but it's interesting, when Councillor Purser spoke, obviously you broadened it out, so thank you for that. So I appreciate you wasn't only speaking about Northampton. Having said that, I have got some, some positive news about Northampton to report in a moment. Um, I think because of the nature of this particular motion, we're not going to be able to accept it in its entirety. But I do, I do think it has some, some merits and some positive points within it. Um, but what I'd like to do is give you a quick, um, quick update on some of the initiatives and some of the, some of the views. Um, but, but also, actually, to pick up on some of the points such as electric cars, etc. Of course, it was this government that um, obviously put the ban on internal combustion engine cars, uh, which is obviously welcome, but even that will provide a challenge to residents across the area in terms of uh, getting ready for that and obviously replacing those vehicles. So we know even the, the challenges we have from moving to that is, uh, is quite, quite large. Um, so, like I said, the, the points are welcome, but we won't accept it um, as, a, as a motion because we can't uh, amend it. But I would like to say, actually, that um, we have been awarded um, a grant of £148,000, a shade over, which is actually in page 38 of your pack here, which is great news. And uh, that's obviously a joint bid from regulatory services and highways. So we are working on that and we do take it seriously. Um, what that will actually do is it will um, allow us to fund uh, the purchase and the installation uh, of our own real-time air quality. And that was one of the issues that came across there uh, from one of the speakers um, to, to measure those um, uh, particular pollutants that we were speaking of earlier and uh, the NOx, etc. These will be obviously linked to traffic management so we can start to detect patterns and take that real-time data to see where we might tailor our policy, etc. And uh, with that, obviously, we can start to use uh, ambient media such as signs, etc. I know in the past, actually, I've um, taken views um, from Labour members, actually, particularly about idling outside of schools, etc. And I think that's a very valid point. Um, we're also very close to bringing our forward our plans uh, for the Declaration of Revised Air Quality Management Area in Northampton itself, and uh, we'll bring a report uh, actually on that in June cabinet is the, the target for that, actually, so that should give us um, some good update on that one. Um, we genuinely do take this seriously, but there are some issues in the, uh, the motion that's put forward, which means can't accept it, um, but very happy, happy to keep the dialogue open. And uh, I think we, we also need some of the issues there. We need to be quite cognizant of the impact it can have, uh, the unintended consequences, particularly with clean air zones, uh, albeit the concept itself is quite a sound one. And um, really, if you look at other areas such as toaster, of course, th these are quite big areas um, where measurement is already taking place. So um, thank you very much for the, uh, for the motion and the speakers and the public. I hope that goes some way to telling we are addressing it and we'll be able to report back in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Can I now call on Councillor Emma Roberts to respond, please? You have two minutes, Councillor. I'll Roberts. try my best. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, huge disappointment. Uh, firstly, the, the motion states that in many parts of West Northamptonshire, so we did cover the whole area. Um, but this council, in a moment, in a leader's report, is talking the talk, but we've just taken a tiptoe rather than walk the walk. 
It's a really sad week for sustainability in West North Ants. We've got a leader's report that talks about how important this is to us, yet this administration won't support a motion it quite likes, but doesn't like all of it. Whilst you couldn't have submitted an amendment, you could have contacted me, as did the other um, group, um, the Liberal Democrats, and talked about potential alterations to the detail. So urge you to do that in future. A motion regarding road safety and combating the environment, mental issues sorry, of excess speed uh, that, that can cause was already voted down last year. Pollution-related diseases disproportionately affect poorer people and disproportionately affects those with protected characteristics. It will be such a shame for this council not to recognise that Councilor and Robertson, take a huge step ago. forward. Thank you. It's a, this is an environmental issue, but it's also an issue of social justice. You heard from the speakers earlier, your communities want you to act. The motion is in line with the Council's sustain, sustainability strategy. The motion will support the UN Sustainable Goals 3, 11, 12 and 13. I don't have time, but you know what they are. The, the motion would allow unified action that was called for, and if you had political will, you could see this through. As I say, it's a sad week for sustainability with you not supporting this motion. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to ask for a vote. You vote, it'll be a show of hands, um, a vote for, against, um, and abstention. Those in favour, please vote now. Those against. And any abstentions, please? <laughs> uh, the vote is lost. We now come to um, item seven, cabinet members' reports um, and record of decisions taken uh, by the cabinet. This item is limited now to 60 minutes. Um, I understand that all reports have been circulated to members. Time limit. Cabinet members should try very hard, please, to limit themselves to two minutes to whatever they want to say. So I'm now going to um, ask Councillor Jonathan Nunn, please, um, to start the ball rolling. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Let's see if we can get through the full list of Cabinet members this evening. Uh, you'll notice I've mentioned sustainability. Actually, I'll come back to that in a second. Also, staff reorganisation. The communications team is probably one of the second after executive support to be um, uh, reorganised and into permanent slots. And we're looking to get that done, of course, for all staff for very, very soon uh, and, and not a moment too soon. Update there on some of the transformation projects and how that's going through the department. Finally mentioned the Thrive Awards. I think when we all started this new council, we worried most about culture. We wanted people to feel valued, appreciated and engaged. I'm delighted to say that I think we're achieving that. And if you get the chance to, you either attended or you get the chance through the internet to watch the Thrive Awards, you'll see the wonderful um, feelings of, 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 of mutual sort of trust and confidence and appreciation that our staff are showing to each other through nominating each other for these wonderful awards and through a thing called the Kudo Board, which is where they give a chance to give tribute to their fellow members of staff. It really is, is fantastic. I was going to mention briefly, in case we don't get to Councillor Golby, uh, Councillor Smith's report, that you would have had today um, from um, Tracy uh, an invite 7th or the 5th. This is the locality session for the integrated care. Really important that we as councillors have input, uh, and that's at 8.30 uh, for 9 o'clock start until 11 on the 7th of May. Of course, after that, it gives you a chance to go and visit the Knife Angel. I'm just going to come back to sustainability. Um, it's really, really important. The cross-party committee, we have met once, we are spending the thick end of a day away on a workshop within the next week or two. And we'll have a proper look at issues, a proper look at issues. We'll look at the stuff that's being discussed this evening. I, I think policy on the hoof, I think we can do better than that. We'll discuss all these issues and we'll discuss them properly. I, I've spent four or five hours on one motion, that, that, that's the Ukraine one. There just is not always the time to go through the constant amendments. If, if what we want to do is rush for headlines and, and, and out virtue each other, let's keep banging the motions in. Actually, the cross-party group meets. It will then also meet with the representatives who we've seen of some of the other groups and will thrash these things out properly and come to proper conclusions. That don't, don't take any suggestion 
and what others might tell you about the lack of importance of sustainability this council. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I have here a, a couple of people who would like to speak. First of all, Councillor Roberts. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I, I fully accept, Councillor Nunn, that there's a sustainability working group. I'm on it, so you know, I'm really pleased to be part of it. But this isn't policy on the hoof. And this isn't about virtue signaling or press releases either. And, and given that this authority released, I think, seven press releases in one day, the other day, I think headline grabbing is not something that we're doing. It's something that you're, you're currently doing. But, you know, there we go. So the, um, on, the, on the report it's, itself, um, I had a concern that there was no reference whatsoever to the Sixfield situation. Um, I did request that you made a statement to full council in respect of the position that had been raised with regards to your commentary at Cabinet around conversations with Sildara and CDNL. Um, I did request that verbally and I did request that in writing as well. I haven't received a response from yourself or the officers, so I was concerned it wasn't there. Um, there's a paragraph on the... I was going to comment on sustainability, but I think we've done that. Um, there's a paragraph in the back on transformation around um, things being sorted out, but there's a few minor issues outstanding. I just wondered what they were and if you could give me a timeline for, for resolution or commit to providing me with that detail. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to convert, you know, the Thrive Awards, if staff like them and staff want them, then that's excellent. And peer nomination is, is incredible and often the best form of compliment coming from them. So I, I welcome those awards and, and just express my thanks, as you have done, to, to the way in which the staff have worked in this authority over the last year. Thank you. Just coming on some of those things. I think as members, we came slightly late to the awards as well. I was absolutely thrilled to be there. Proposal for next year. I'd like to see a way in which we can uh, add a members nominated uh, one as well, because I know many of you have officers who support you tremendously well, and, and that would be nice to have that input, uh, uh, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, OK. I, I think in terms of the transformation, I think probably since the report was written a week ago, we probably dotted those I's and crossed those T's. But I'll check and I'll let you know. Uh, literally, it was almost, almost there was what we were trying to say. Um, on that. H happy to confirm on, on the query with Sildara. Um, uh, okay, so there's a process that you go through, we, we'll approach that, but just reference my comments. So you get a lot of people get in touch, but actually when there is a formal process going on, you have to be careful with the contact you have with people. Just before the end of the Borough Council, it was quite clear to NTFC that their conversation should be with they use the phrase the West, and they started to talk with Theresa Grant at the time and, and Anna Earnshaw and so on. I had no contact at all, not even response to a Christmas, uh, uh, have a happy Christmas message to the football club. That was just the right thing to do. Uh, during the time of the borough, Sildara, uh, the, the local representatives of, of which we would know them as Sildara, came to the Guilds Hall here, uh, uh, or through the pandemic we met on teams. They had a strong interest in purchasing the football club. They showed us four, five, six investors who wanted to purchase the football club. When the news went public uh, that they, we were close to getting an arrangement with NTFC, which was in November, uh, that flushed out um, an offer from Sildara. That came to me initially from the point I knew we were doing that. I then handed over to the chief executive. So at the time we took that cabinet decision, I had had, not, uh, I'd had no contact with the football club for well over a year and no contact at all with any members of Sildara during the whole of that negotiation process. I did meet Jim Kelly of Sildara and a whole bunch of other potential investors. There is absolutely no doubt in what I intended there, and I intended two things. One, to give the assurance that there was not excessive member input into any Sixfields deal, because that was a criticism of the original deal in 2013 at the borough. And the second was by way of explanation to those people who may think it's odd that you don't respond to uh, email contact. That was not the right thing to do, and that was why I made those comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Beardsworth. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the update on the Sildera and um, Sixfield situation and the um, judicial reviews that are going ahead. I understand the sensitivity of it and realise it's not always to put in a, a report, but glad to see it. Um, going to sustainability, um, the leaders just said to us, you know, we, we're grabbing headlines, but I think sometimes he loses sight of the fact of what an opposition party is. Because, you, let's be honest, you've been in power quite a long time and you've probably forgotten what it's like that you have to hold the administration to account. And this is what we try and do, and we try and do it nicely, and sometimes we hit below the belt, and I appreciate that. Um, so, but it, that's our job, and it's not personal. It's about 
holding this administration to account. Can I also say well done for doing what we suggested in our budget with the transportation team. We're very grateful you've implemented it so quickly. I think that was um, a sort of joint decision. You were thinking about it and we thought it was a good idea as well. So great minds think alike. So I think that's all I've got to say. But the sustainability programme, I think it's very important that we push on with that. I know, I know people are saying, but when we get the strength of feeling from the public that we've had tonight, we have to make sure that we listen to them and, and actually learn from them because these people have got a lot of expertise we could use. Thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you. Just to acknowledge, I think probably more comments than questions, but just to acknowledge them. We welcome the check and challenge. We welcome the ideas. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Sally. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Al-Wahabi. I, I just want to make an announcement that's okay. And it's a member briefing on May 7th afterwards and invite members to the aid on the race course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nobody else has wanted to question the leader. So we'll go on to Councillor Adam Brown, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, starting off with uh, LIBO, as members will have noted today, some uh, potential good news on the St. James uh, LIBO front. Uh, I've been lobbied hard by uh, local members uh, over this library. Uh, it's one that the local community had felt the loss of very, very hard indeed uh, over the last few years. So to have had a successful and viable bid come forward from an operator who I'm unable to name at this uh, point in time is good news indeed. Uh, I was uh, rapidly given a quick uh, ward boundary lesson by Councillor Roberts earlier today who uh, was sh uh, sharp enough to notice that actually it crossed the ward boundary, just uh, only just, uh, but we shall be uh, communicating with all members concerned as this deal heads to what, what will hopefully be a successful conclusion. Heard a lot of talk about sustainability this evening, so I think it's excellent news that uh, via West Northamptonshire Council and MPH, we've managed to secure six million pounds from the government's social housing decarbonisation fund. This will assist us with upgrading the insulation and the, uh, the energy efficiency of 150 uh, of our council houses. And at a time when energy efficiency contributes to lower energy bills, uh, during a cost of living crisis, I think that's most welcome news and uh, I can only hope that we'll be successful in any further rounds of bidding uh, that comes forward. Uh, I'm in constant communication with MPH about how they'll be able to assist their tenants with any future financial difficulties. Uh, they're assisting them on the, uh, on the energy efficiency front. They're going to assist them with benefits advice. Uh, they take their duty of care to their tenants extremely seriously uh, and I thank them for that. Uh, we've got a, a short section in the report on museums. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that at Northampton Museum uh, we'll shortly be having a, a Star Wars themed uh, exhibition uh, named May the Toys Be With You. Um, I didn't choose the title. Uh, I'm uh, ashamed to admit that I've only ever watched one Star Wars film and I can't remember the title. But uh, apparently these things are very, very popular and it's uh, allegedly going to be uh, a very successful exhibition. Uh, for those of you with children, we've also got a uh, when the, ti uh, the Tiger Who Came to Tea uh, exhibition coming up in the forthcoming months, which is uh, more my cup of tea, and I'll be taking my, my family along to that. Uh, the Cultural Compact is an exciting initiative. Uh, in, a, in a world where retail and town centres are struggling, the ambition to make Northampton Town Centre a cultural destination is one that we should all get behind. We're in communication with cultural groups of all shapes and sizes, not just the Royal and Derngate. Um, uh, Councillor Eastwood and I had a very successful meeting with Watson Hall Theatre uh, a couple of weeks ago to try and support their efforts to get uh, more funding. Uh, and I hope that will lead to a successful outcome. They provide fantastic youth services. Uh, they cater to a very diverse audience. I think they're a great addition to uh, the, uh, the cultural scene in Northampton. Uh, lastly, Madam Chairman, because I think I may be running short on time, I'd just like to give a, a quick mention to the group of uni the University of Northampton students sat at the back of the room. Uh, they're journalism students. They were kind enough to invite me along to one of their seminars recently. Uh, they asked some very tough and pressing questions, so I'm sure they'll go on to very successful careers, and uh, I hope they enjoy this evening's proceedings. Councillor Stone. Thank you, uh Madam Chair, um, I'd like to ask you some questions about the 
care leavers protocol, if that's okay with Councillor Brown. Um, first question is, are you aware that a lot of care leavers are being put into supported housing at the age of 16? And is that something that you approve of? Um, following on from that, what age do you think it is okay to put young care leavers into supported lodging um, as a way of, you know, helping them bridge the, 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 the transition from childhood to adulthood? One of the things that's really worrying me about supported lodgings is, does anybody know how many supported lodgings, supported housing providers we've got? I would really like to know how many we've got, and I would really like to know how many houses there are and how many beds there are um, as a total. Uh, because I, from my knowledge of what is going on, it has become quite unmanageable, and I think we need to know who has got a grip on all of that. My view has always been, and I've said it many times, that rather than having supported housing, we should be putting in place a framework for supporting lodgings. So that would give young people in transition from childhood to adulthood the freedoms of an adult with the protections that they need of being in a family house. I'd like to know if the protocol is going to be considering that. Is the Cabinet member responsible aware that where a lot of the supported housing is, is in the areas of the cheapest housing where there is the greatest deprivation, where is the highest amount of criminal activity, including serious, violent and sexual crimes? And our young people in those situations do not have, in my view, enough protection. Not to reply. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, so on the question of supported housing, what age would be appropriate, uh, whether, uh, whether care leavers should go into supporting housing, I think we need to be looking at things on a case-by-case -case basis. It's vital that care leavers have the wraparound support and the appropriate uh, accommodation for their needs. And if Councillor Stone's aware of any cases where she believes that, that's a, uh, that the support being given is inappropriate, then I'd be willing to speak to her on that at, at any point. Uh, on the questions of how many supported housing providers that we have, uh, we, we do have multiple housing providers. I'm quite happy to go away and get to the answers to uh, how, many, uh, how many beds, how many uh, specific uh, units of accommodation we have on that front. Uh, again, if Councillor Stone believes that the situation is unmanageable, uh, I think that's uh, something that should be reported to officers and, and me with the utmost urgency. It doesn't need to wait for a full council meeting. Uh, that should be raised uh, in instantly. Uh, we obtain and we procure supported housing across a wide range of areas. Some of those will be in areas of higher deprivation, some of them will be in more salubrious areas. Uh, we constantly review the adequacy uh, and the appropriateness of, of all of those supported housing uh, units and if Councillor Stone has any, again, any specific concerns about particular units, I'd be more than happy to raise those with officers. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Um, I didn't know about your meeting with Warts and All, and I'm, I'm delighted to say that, declaring interest, my daughter attended the Warts and All drama um, group, which unfortunately lost its funding, and she was gutted, absolutely devastated, so really pleased to hear that. It also sits in Delapree Abbey, um, who've been hugely supportive again, which sits in my ward, so I would be very happy to talk to you about any support for the organisations there. They're an incredible historic drama group. Um, on the cultural impact points, I just wondered how much funding we'd been awarded and whether or not um, the role that's being supported was a permanent role. Um, because with that, what's and all, was going to, I was going to say that many projects had reported a loss of funding. Um, I, I wonder if the funding opportunity would then be presented back to them as a result of that. Um, and whether or not, if that role isn't a permanent role, how we intend to follow that through so that we can actually achieve the goals of the, of the fund in the first place. Um, and then um, I know that you'll be aware, Councillor Brown, because I know that you, you follow the uh, heritage groups closely on social media, um, but many of them had significant concerns about the archives and the use of the archives and actually the loss of items and records and assets. So I just wondered what we were doing at the moment to ensure that our local historians and historic societies, um, including the late Mike Ingram, um, rest in peace, who, that this is happening that we are 
protecting those archives and assets and we're ensuring that they stay in Northampton Town and in the wider West Northamptonshire. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Councillor Roberts for her questions. Uh, in terms of the cultural compact and the funding uh, package allocated to us, uh, Arts Council England uh, are funding the, uh, the salary of the, uh, of the, of the chair uh, of the cultural compact. Um, it's, it's only, I believe it's only for an initial 12 months that we've secured the funding. We'll have to reapply uh, for, for that package uh, moving forward. But um, you know, given the progress to date and the, and the wide range of support that the chair's already managed to obtain from the, uh, from the arts community, Community, uh, in Northampton, uh, I'd have every confidence that we'll uh, we'll secure that support. Um, since the uh, the days of Sakemka, uh, we've steadily and progressively rebuilt our relationships with the uh, with the arts world uh, to the point where we're now able to secure uh, national exhibitions um, uh, at Northampton Museum from the Tate Gallery, from Yorvik in in Yorkshire, uh, and many others besides. Uh, on the point of the archives. Uh, it, it, we have moved a significant portion of our archives to a specialist facility at Chester House. It happens to sit within North Northamptonshire. Uh, however, it will, it's been specifically designed to allow greater accessibility for academics and other interested parties uh, to study aspects uh, of the archives. We still do retain um, a significant portion of uh, archive material, uh, non-archaeological uh, artefacts uh, within uh, the Guildhall. Um, the, uh, the leather collection is uh, retained at uh, the Grosvenor Centre Centre. Uh, there's an ongoing review by the museum staff, led, uh, led by the muse Northampton Museum Manager, uh, regarding future provision of suitable uh, archive space. Uh, we comply with national guidelines on uh, cataloguing of artefacts, uh, and, and we do our best to procure the most suitable facilities wherever we can. We know that there's extra funding and extra investment required uh, to get the absolute best facilities, but uh, you know, we do take our responsibility on that front extremely seriously. Thank you. Councillor Zoe Smith, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, really glad to see the references made to um, housing-led solutions for rough sleepers. It's particularly the housing first model and the principle of housing first is something that we looked at very closely previously in scrutiny in the old Northampton borough and I felt was really strongly borne out by the approach taken to rough sleeping during the COVID pandemic where we saw really remarkable results coming through as a result of that housing-led approach. I'm just and wanting to ensure that we are tracking really carefully the demographics of the rough sleepers and the homeless population in Northampton, that we're aware of things like gender impacts and sexuality and LGBT people and younger people, and really aware how we can best meet that and those needs and spot any patterns emerging. Also really keen that we're looking at the issues of hidden homelessness, which again, and sofa surfing, which can really particularly um, affect vulnerable rough sleepers, such as women and young people, and often the LGBT population, so that we're really targeting and we're really aware of the true scale of our sort of situation there, and we're not just looking at obvious rough sleepers on the streets, but people who may be in really vulnerable homelessness situations. Thank you to Councillor Smith for her questions and comments. Um, you know, I'm you know, quite proud in a way to say that the first priority I set for the, for the housing team was that we continue to follow the principles of everyone in uh, after the pandemic. Uh, I didn't want to lose any of the momentum that had been gained during the pandemic in terms of our impact on the, on the rough sleeping issue uh, in Northampton uh, m most particularly. I also requested that we extend and enhance our uh, <coughs> severe weather emergency protocols. That, that was done uh, despite the additional pressure that that puts on our extremely dedicated housing team and I just want to give a mention to those members of staff because they are people who are out in all weathers at all hours of the day and night uh, helping people in very vulnerable situations often at times putting themselves in positions of vulnerability they work extremely hard and at times they get uh, a bit of a bad press uh, from certain uh, from certain groups in the community and unfairly so uh, because they, you know, these are some of the most dedicated professionals that I've ever met uh, and they deserve our, our full support uh, we do track demographics of, of rough sleepers. 
Um, I, I can pass some of that data to Councillor Smith if, if she's interested. Uh, certainly in terms of nationality, in terms of sex, um, I believe there are statistics on, uh, on LGBT uh, numbers as well within that cohort, um, but I'll look that up for her and get back to her on that point. Hidden homelessness by its very nature is a more difficult um, issue to track. Uh, it is, you know, without apology that I say that rough sleeping is our top priority. Uh, that isn't to say that the issues of hidden homelessness aren't important, and certainly I, you know, I, I won't avoid the fact that we should and could be doing more uh, on that. Uh, and we'll certainly be, certainly are in contact with, uh, with DLUC uh, at every available opportunity to secure extra accommodation, to secure extra provision in terms of uh, temporary accommodation and other facilities to assist with homelessness and those at risk of becoming homeless. You know, very often now, uh, we have people coming to the one-stop shop here at the Guildhall or presenting at other council offices around West Northamptonshire, people who are at risk of becoming homeless, but because of the provision we have in place, they don't become homeless. Uh, and that's something that uh, every councillor in this building should, should take a degree of pride in. Uh, I want to continue doing more of that, and uh, I'm confident that with the hard work of the teams behind this, uh, we'll, we'll be able to do so. Uh, Councillor Jonathan Harris, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome, of course, the announcement regarding the social housing decarbonisation. Um, I wonder whether Councillor Brown could give an indication on when work is expected to commence and when it's expected to be completed. Um, secondly, how will the impact be monitored and measured? Because there's clearly an opportunity, I think, uh, to develop potentially some case study material from here. Uh, and it would be really good to have some pre and post measurement involved. Um, it also strikes me that there is a wider opportunity here to capture the learning of this work. Clearly it's being implemented on social housing, but there is a potentially a wider opportunity to share with the public the sorts of works that are being completed for reference and knowledge. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Councillor Harris. Uh, work's already started uh, on the social housing stock, um, uh, thanks to the government grant that we've uh, received. Uh, there's no firm end date um, uh, for the work, simply because of the nature of uh, accessing properties and uh, getting underway with, with the tasks. It's, uh, it's, it's not possible to, come up, uh, to, to deliver a concrete date for completion. However, I will, uh, I will go back to MPH and ask them for an updated estimate on when they're expected to complete those works. Very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can we now um, go on to Councillor Phil Larratt, please? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, just a few points to make. Um, members will be pleased to know, particularly those in the south of the district, that the HS2 Marshal will be taking up post in mid May, and uh, I hope that we'll be able to arrange uh, an event, sort of a meet the Marshal event. Uh, for members in the locality of HS2 to, to meet up with him and get to know him. It is a him, Madam Chairman. Um, so uh, that's a good bit of news. Um, unfortunately, the, um, we weren't successful in securing money for our uh, bid for buses. Um, we do want to sort of learn from the lessons, or learn the lessons from our bid and we're waiting for, still waiting feedback from uh, DFT and as soon as we get that we will look at what it was that we didn't get right and start preparing further bids in order to make sure we get some funding going forward. Um, the new highways contract, um, I missed that sorry, um, there is a paper going to cabinet next week as to how we will uh, be dealing with the award of the contract. Um, great news that the Farthinghoe Recycling Centre's opened and I have to say that the operators are delighted with the way that that is going um, and uh, uh, um, uh, are very positive uh, going forward. Um, parks and open spaces, um, I actually visited Daventry uh, Country Park yesterday um, and it was brilliant to see the new team uh, working together because we have disaggregated uh, from uh, the north and we've integrated the wardens that uh, used to work in the country parks with the wardens who work in Northampton and we now have a, a countryside and parks team uh, and uh, it was great to have you know people from 
all across the district now working together in, in what it, uh, is a fantastic facility and a growing facility in Daventry. Um, local nature recovery strategy. This is a, a new um, uh, uh, responsibility that we have. I don't know very much about it, um, and I'm sure members probably don't as well. So um, we will be arranging a briefing for members on what that actually involves going forward. I think other than that, Madam Chair, I have nothing to, nothing to add to the report. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, Councillor Brown's not in the room, but uh, with Councillor Larrett and your indulgence, I, I was remiss of me not to thank him for um, responding so quickly to my concerns today over the, the whole library press release. Um, and Councillor, both Councillor Eels um, have been delighted with the work that they've been able to do with the Sixfields Ward councillors um, on securing the, uh, the situation that we'll see with the operator there. On to Councillor Larrett's report, though. Um, I, I'm going to make no apology for making a few ward pleas, um, Councillor Larrett. I've been normally deal directly with the officers and email you, but we're not getting anywhere with a couple of items. On the ID Verdi contract, we've had no work whatsoever done in Delapree Park at all under the terms of the contract, and we're not seeing the gardener that is appointed to the park um, actually attending. I've been told they are, they're not. So if you can look at that for me separately um, and get a real answer on that, I'd be really grateful. Um, look forward to seeing the details on the new highways contract. I took a really interesting walk with some um, highways officers um, this last month. Um, so a plea would be that if we, when we get the new contract, we can look at not using this, um, I'm going to call it crack-filling putty. It, it looks horrible. Um, it really is a mess. And it's being used to fill quite significant holes when it should only be used to fill very, very small sort of seal gaps. Um, it's also being used to fill areas where tree roots have come up through the ground. And, and it really it's quite offensive and I think dangerous personally. So I really hope you can you can look at that point as well. Great to see some active travel funding. I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what that looks like um, and how we can actually achieve some goals. I really do think we should talk to community groups on the work that they think we can do on that to, to put some uh, measures in place. And um, maybe we could take a trip over to Cholton in Manchester where they've done some fabulous work on active travel as well. And we might be able to learn some, some items. Um, and I think that's me a lot in please at the moment. Thank you, Councillor Larratt for the report. Thank you, Thank you uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, I'll certainly look into the situation at Delapri. I mean, uh, I've been I met with you down there and um, we have um, understanding that uh, work was going to be done. If it's not, I'll find out what's going on for you and uh, see what we can do. Um, the use of materials, I hear what you say. Um, we need to make sure that what we do, we do appropriate, is appropriate and fit for purpose. Um, and when we get the new contractor, I think it will be in the period before, between the contract, it will be in the setup period that the contractor will meet with members and perhaps these issues could be way, raised at that particular time. So I think, um, yeah, be prepared. Uh, we're going to have some sort of interaction with the new contractor before they actually start, and we can take things forward uh, then. So that's good. Active travel. I'm not opposed to active travel. I'm just opposed to daft schemes. Um, you know, and I think it's fair to say that we've got to look at what is going on. I mean, I know full well that all that development that's gone on out towards Junction 16 from Northampton, the developers have put in some really good cycling facilities. The trouble is, it doesn't join up. It doesn't join up to, to anywhere else. And I think we really need to look at what we've got and how we join these things up. But as I've said before, the Billing Road scheme is off the agenda as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Councillor Rosie Humphreys, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Larratt, I've got a few questions for you. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm sure all members will share the disappointment that West North Ants was not one of the 31 local authorities included in the latest bus funding announcement. And I uh, just wanted to ask if you'll be sharing the feedback from the DFT that you've requested. So that's one, one of my questions. Secondly, 
uh, the three climate strategies that you mention, uh, in addition to the active travel strategy for which you've got funding, I, I'll assume they'll all be coming to Cabinet, and in particular on the active travel, what, what, what's your time frame for that? Um, as regards chargeable garden waste permits, um, you mentioned that around 33,000 have, have been purchased. I got somewhere in my memory that, that you uh, thought the expectation might be more like 60,000 take up. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or, but perhaps you can uh, kindly comment on that. And um, finally, um, uh, there are 15 British funded companies that are continuing to operate in Russia, including Veolia. Uh, who, who collect Northampton's waste, of course. So um, are you aware of this? And if not, will you be contacting the company uh, to ask if they're intending to withdraw? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, thank you for those questions. Um, as I said, it was a great shame that we didn't succeed in uh, securing money for buses. Um, and we desperately want to, to... We've desperately got ideas that we want to get off the ground, particularly in the rural areas where their services are just so totally lacking, uh, particularly for young people uh, and uh, for them to access education uh, and to access uh, uh, other things as well. So we desperately need to get that done. We will get the feedback. I'm happy to share the feedback um, and uh, make sure that that, that happens. Um, active travel, yes, we're preparing an active travel strategy for West Northamptonshire. But we've also got some local active travel um, uh, which should fall out of the active travel strategy. We've actually started some of the more local ones. We've got one up and going in for Brackley and a lot of work is being done there on providing uh, a cycle link between Brackley and Silverstone um, for educational purposes, business purposes, people working there. And we're trying to work with HS2 to ensure that what they do and what they construct allows for that cycleway. So, so things are already going on. We've started doing some things in Northampton locally, and we're about to start doing things in Daventry. But the actual strategy itself, I envisage being completed during this current year. Um, garden waste, we have had, uh, up until the 11th of April, 61,224 subscriptions. Sorry, I didn't update the report. Uh, but yeah, uh, up until the 11th of April, and there's more coming in, still coming in. So uh, 61,224 to then. I hear what you say about Veolia. I personally wasn't aware of that, but happy to look into it and uh, see what, what influence we can exert. Thank you. Sorry, may I just come back on one thing, please? The, the um, three climate strategies, uh, the estate climate strategy, construction and maintenance and fleet climate strategy, uh, are they going to come to Cabinet? I believe they will, yes, later in the day uh, when we put our plan together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Meredith, please. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, the Lib Dem group on the Town Council, we've done a walk around, around the Town Centre uh, to have a look at uh, some of the issues that have been raised um, by some of the residents who frequently use the Town Centre. And I have, to, I have to admit, I was quite surprised to see how dirty the Town Centre has become. We found lots of uh, detritus, we found lots of litter, and when we walked through the alleyways to the Market Square, the um, smell of urine was absolutely appalling. Now, we have put in a bid uh, to become a city status, and I don't think we will get this bid. Uh, we will get this um, city status if we carry on neglecting the town centre. And I say, quite honestly, neglecting the town centre. It's just some areas, uh, especially the, the, the back streets where the Cauldranger is, uh, that's Witherspoons, uh, the 
uh, where people go to, for leisure. Uh, bin, these Euro bins all over the place, all scattered over the uh, thing. What, uh, anybody coming to visit Northampton would be horrified, absolutely. Now, the reason, Councillor Larratt, I raised this is because I spoke to two residents today who had visited Daventry. And they told me quite clearly that Daventry is a lovely, clean, tidy town. And, but to compare to Northampton, it's, you know, it leads a lot to believe. So what it really needs, Councillor Larratt, we need to get this city status. We need to book more help, more people going round with uh, brushes and brooms and sweeping up and pressure washers, uh, because otherwise we're going to fail on the city status, because the town centre should be a, uh, how can I put it, a centre of excellence if we are going to get city status. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Yes, of course, the town centre and cleanliness therein is very, very important. And we do need to address it. And I think you will find that in the Veolia contract, the town centre, the specification for the town centre is significantly more or higher than it was previously. Um, clearly, there, see, from what you're telling me with the number of fly tips and litter and alleyways, I will ask officers to ensure that they are delivering to the specification. Um, I'm pretty sure they are. I mean, today, Councillor Strachan and I uh, went out uh, uh, visiting uh, Kingsley Park Terrace, and I have to say that the, uh, the standard up there was pretty good. Yes, there was problems, don't get me wrong, but overall, it was generally very, to a very high standard. I hear what you say about the ridings, uh, you know, the cordway and all around there. It would be lovely to get that sorted out. Um, there are options, very expensive options, but things that perhaps we should be looking at as well, because I drove down there the other day uh, uh, and it was absolutely, totally and utterly horrendous. Um, uh, the bins were full, overflowing, rubbish was blowing everywhere and what have you. And uh, can I thank you for your comments about Daventry? Daventry is very clean, very tidy. Um, we had a few issues with litter bins following the opening of the cinema, uh, not being cleaned or not being emptied often enough, but we've soon put that right. So, yeah, yeah, thank you for those comments. Councillor Irvin Swift. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, can I ask uh, Councillor Larat? Uh, we have had quite a successful uh, week of cleaning up in rural area where you land all our um, villages, some equipment. Can we have that going forward forever? And uh, how can we help with the fly tipping? Because I think that was maybe with Councillor uh, David Smith. Uh, but I think those, uh, after what um, uh, our, my predecessor said, I think uh, it is, I'm very proud to have a rural area cleaner and cleaner. So how could you help us to help you <coughs> to make us cleaner? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, there, there is a requirement of uh, all our contractors to provide a, a level of service uh, and under whatever uh, that specification may be. Um, I think fly tipping personally is the scourge of society in many respects because it, it just makes everywhere, it brings everywhere down, you know, uh, whether it be a rural area or an urban area. And we do need to address it across the piece. So, you know, I'm happy to uh, look at particularly how we deal with fly tipping in rural areas. I mean, in my ward, uh, up until we became a unitary authority, we had a road that was the border between Northampton and South Northampton. And it is used regularly by fly tippers, tyres and this, that and the other. And, you know, it was ridiculous that you had to get Northampton Borough Council out 
to clear the fly tips or their contractors to clear the fly tip one side of the road and they wouldn't touch that the other side because it was South North Hans. So, you know, and that was a rural road. That was a rural road. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think there are issues. I'm happy to take on board what, what the councillor has said. And yes, let's look at the specification for clearing up fly tips in rural areas. Councillor Strachan, please. Um, Councillor Wendy Randall. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just a point on Daventry Town Centre. Obviously, we've got Daventry Town Council um, that is now working and taking over all of our open spaces, apart from Borough Hill and the Country Park. Um, and they are working very closely with Norse, who are doing an exceptional job. Um, they respond extremely well. Um, but the town is looking really, really pretty. But the only place that is a really sad looking area at the moment are, is the bus station. They've had panels of glass missing for months and months and months. It is a dirty area. Um, they've got posters on the front. So when people are standing in front of an area that has got um, a piece of glass in, they can't even see when the bus arrives because it's just blocked out by a poster. So I'd be really grateful to know when we're going to get the new panels in the bus stop and I'll pass on to the town council that, you know, visitors are saying that it looks very pretty. Thank you. Can I, can I thank Councillor Randall for her comments and can I ask her to pass on uh, our thanks to the town council for what they're doing in, in, in helping to keep Daventry as clean as it possibly can be. I have been made aware of the situation with the bus station in Daventry. I do need to go and have a look at it myself when, um, as soon as I can fix up a time with, fix up a time with Chris Rag and that, I'll be out there to have a look at it and see what we can do. Thank you very much. No, no further questions. No further questions. Uh, we then move on to Councillor Malcolm Logley, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, there's two parts to this report, as you've probably already observed and the most important one I, I think is the um, to report on the year-end outlook financially um, the report I've put together was based on period 11 figures um, and if anybody wants the details a very detailed report you all have access to it and but the important point of that is it shows a very small underspend for the forecast for the year end of 33,000 pounds and that's without um, having to um, dip into, I think, the uh, phrase, <coughs> the £5 million pounds contingency we put in for unexpected events. So I'm not expecting any, anything of any drama in period 12, which is now gone, but we haven't got the final figures. So I think it's fair to say that um, we, can, we can expect a, a balanced budget this, this, uh, in our first financial year, which is, of course, um, we expect it to be the most difficult one of all. Um, the year we're currently going into then becomes a, a more of a consolidation, as you all heard very uh, in great detail at the, one of the most recent, um, recent uh, meetings here. Um, with regard to the assets, uh, there's a lot of projects going on, a lot of sorting out to be done at the moment, um, following, uh, following the, the four units coming together. And there's a lot of detail on there. If anybody wants any specific detail, please email me and, um, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Other than that, uh, um, Chair, I'm going to stick to my two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll start with uh, Councillor Stone. Thank you very much, and thank you for the report. Um, really interesting to read all the stuff around assets, but I'm a bit disappointed we haven't got more information uh, giving us actual figures about what's happening with the revenue budget. And I'm a bit puzzled about you referencing £5 million contingency fund, because I thought during the budget setting process we had added £4 million to that from the unexpected windfall from the government, so it's a £9 million contingency. So I'd quite like to know where that £4 million has gone. 
You may not be worried about the budget for the coming year, but I certainly am, because I think there's going to be enormous pressures, not the least, on energy bills. And I think it would be good to have a bit of forewarning about what to expect. We, for most of us, I think, um, we all had a shock on April the 6th to see that our energy bills had doubled and, in some cases, tripled. So I think, given the huge estate that we've got, we need to be really cautious about making claims that we're going to be able to balance the budget when we have got runaway energy uh, price increases. So I think I'm really quite bothered about that. And there are other pressures as well, not least in staffing. So I'm just wondering what the portfolio finance holder thinks about the GMB union's uh, claim at the moment with Veolia, where we've given 5.5% increase to Veolia for them to meet their budget pressures, but they haven't, they're not using that to meet um, the needs of the staff in terms of the pressures on staff and their cost of living crisis. So I think as a council, we need to have a view on that. I think that might be quite helpful. And I would like us to be seen to be supporting the workers, the staff who actually do the delivery. In terms of the assets, I'm grateful for all the information, but there's some information missing from my point of view. I want to know where we're going to be putting the family hubs, the community hubs. These are going to be really crucial assets for us in helping us deliver frontline services. And I don't want the need for that to be lost in the welter of development that is going on. I'm really concerned about what's happening with County Hall. I think it'd be good to have an update on what the proposals for that is. Uh, I've asked several times now for an assessment about whether we could compulsory purchase order St Edmunds Hospital site because I think we badly need the provision that was supposed to be going there for older people, so supported housing for older people, uh, dementia village and so on. Um, it's not coming forward, and I think we ought to be taking charge of that site ourselves. I've also been asking questions about Albion House. It's almost empty. It's a bit... For, we, uh, the borough bought it a few years ago. It's never been properly used. I understand it's got um, concrete cancer, and it may have to come down, but I think we need to know what is happening to some of our essential assets. Thank you. Thank you. Also yep. right, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I think, uh, I think the starting point here, really, let's be very pleased that we're balancing the books this year. And um, um, that uh, um, has not been without its challenges, as uh, you, you'll be aware if you've been party to quite a bit of the discussions there. Um, and that'll be the case next year. That's the job. <laughs> you know, these things are going to come around the corner. We, we expect them to come around the corner. We just don't know what they necessarily be. It's fairly clear that energy will be a significant, or well, inflation generally will be. And um, well aware of that, and, um, and that's, uh, so that's the nature of the job. The job is to deal with these things as they come around, as they come at us, and there'll be other things as well. Um, and, uh, you know, you might even get a couple of good things as well, you never know, more likely they are bad things. So we're not unduly concerned about next year. We're just conscious of these things, and we're conscious that our job is to sort them out as and when they turn up. So... Up there. Um, I say the pressure on energy bills, oh, you're quite right, of course it is, and, and, um, and a very serious one, and, um, um, and others as well, but it's not just energy, there's lots of building items and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, regarding your GMB claim and Veolia, um, I, I wouldn't get involved in that um, as, as, a, as a, a general practice. So we, we deal with Veolia, we have a contract with Veolia. What they do um, is, is a matter very much for them, we think, and that I think, and, and whilst we can influence, I, I certainly wouldn't try and direct, because all you get a comeback there, and the, and the contract is in difficulties. Um, so, regarding the, the assets, um, the family hubs and community hubs that um, Bob spoke about um, fairly recently, um, very supportive of that, and when the projects progressively come up, that is something clearly has got to be dealt with, and, and um, we've got a very good team that will do just that. And, um, so, um, you know, sort of uh, all input, gratefully received. There's no, uh, no, no um, uh, um, monopoly on good ideas, but uh, so that would be dealt with on each of the individual programmes as they come through. And um, we all know Simon, he's an excellent guy, and, um, and he's very much alive to those things as they come up. 
Um, St Edmund's Hospital, you actually mentioned this to me some time ago, you may recall. And I did actually look it up, but I can't remember what the answer is, frankly. But um, it wasn't something we could have dealt with at the time. But I, I, I will follow that up again, as indeed I will with Albion House, and, uh, and come back to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bob Purser, please. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask another asset question, which is the very difficult question of the Westbridge site and a headquarters for <coughs> Northampton Partnership Homes. Realise it's a really difficult issue, but I think it's very important that staff there have good and safe conditions to work in. And I really just urge you and your colleagues to come up with a good solution to what I think is a very difficult problem. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I'm not, I can't quote the detail of the specific uh, arrangements there, but my understanding of it is, is that there is an agreement for an improvement in the site, and I, I think I'm correct in saying, don't quote me specifically, but something on the order of a million pounds is to be spent on it. That's my understanding. Um, if you want specifics, I'll, I'll look at it again, but that's the order of the magnitude. Uh, Councillor Wendy Randall, please. Thank you, Mr Madam Chairman. Um, got a few things that I'd like some answers on, if you have them, please, Councillor Longley. Um, on the estates, I just wondered if there's any update on the Evelyn Wright elderly people's home that was closed down a few years ago. It's looking very um, sad and tired as you go along that piece of road. Um, returning to the offices, um, you know, obviously we're slowly returning, but please, could we make sure there is a first aider on site at all times? We had a terrible tragedy in Daventry and there was no first aider. Um, and sadly, somebody died. It was, you know, a real tragedy. So, you know, that's one point. Um, on the planned maintenance, I just wondered how often that we survey our properties, um, because some seem to fall, fall into quite a disrepair um, before we actually repair them. Um, maybe if we catch them earlier, you know, it would be a cost saving. Um, and the other thing is, I'm just wondered if there's um, an update when we'll see a permanent fix to the car park at the Daventry Sports and Social Club, where Reach for Help, the rehabilitation unit, um, is now on site. Um, I've been speaking to some members. Um, they no longer can access the rehabilitation. They can't drag their wheelchair across. Um, they're just sinking in the stones where they've just filled in these holes. So I just wondered if there's an update on that. Um, and on the school works, very pleased to, sit, to um, read um, that the Daintree or Daintree and Southport Learning Village um, are going to get um, a SEND provision. Um, so that's absolutely brilliant news because, you know, that is really needed. Um, just wondered if there'd be any sort of time frame on that at all. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, um, like the evening right building, I, I pass that quite regularly myself. Uh, I live close to Daventry, as you know, and uh, it is a mess, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't specifically know what it is, but uh, um, I'll, I, I'll, I'll follow as I did with um, Danielle there. As far as the first stage is concerned, I would think that's a necessity always. With all, the, I mean, I always thought that that's what we did anyway in my own um, business. We always got one on site, so uh, you know, it's uh, very important. Sad to hear there's been a tragedy there, and, uh, and I'll, um, I'll pass that on to the appropriate individuals. Surveying, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll follow that one up again, because um, the surveying is, is, I think it was the New York mayor, wasn't it, who says that you, if you put the small things right, you don't tend to get the big things. So um, I'm a great believer in that, and uh, um, I'm in the, in the property business myself, and I know very well that you've got to keep on top of it, because it's, uh, so um, I'm very keen to do that, and... Uh, um, it, it's a good m reminder for me to make sure to get on top of it. So thanks, Wendy. Appreciate that. Um, Daventry Car Park. Now, I've had several emails on that already, as you might imagine. And um, I'll, uh, I'll follow the status of that up because it's got to be done. I, I, I've had exactly what you've said on from two or three other individuals. So I will take that on board to make certain that's cleared. Thank you. Councillor Jonathan Harris, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank to, thanks to Councillor Longley for his report. A couple of questions for you, Councillor Longley. 
Uh, in January, February time, around the budget discussions and the green bin charges being um, discussed around implementation, uh, it was suggested that there was a risk to the year-end numbers at that point to, to the tune of as much as six million. Um, it would appear from a narrative that this risk is no longer there and indeed the five million will no longer be needed and, uh, be needed and potentially um, there will be an underspend of 33,000. This seems to be quite a large differential in, in terms of what is a fairly short six-week period effectively. Uh, and I just wondered whether you could comment on why that's changed so drastically from uh, a potential risk of six million overspend um, to a balanced budget. Uh, it, it certainly raises concerns potentially on confidence in reporting given the short amount of time. Uh, the second question refers to the point about accumulated debt. Could you please provide an indication of what this debt is made up of? Uh, and the final question is, um, many residents are asking about the 150 pound council tax rebate. Could you advise on the timing of when this will be made? There was an expectation, I think, that it was linked to direct debits. That doesn't seem to be in the case for many. And to be clear, that's the council tax rebate, not the energy loan, not loan. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, very, very pleased to talk about this, the, the risk. Um, what you tend to find, uh, my experience has been, um, and this is um, the fourth uh, year I've delivered a, a, a balanced budget, what you tend to find is that uh, at the beginning of the year, the um, apparent um, deficit or, or, or overspend at the year is quite high. Um, and that is, um, if you've ever been a, um, an officer or something of that nature, then you will know why. Because what you do, they, 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 they don't want to get it wrong. They try very hard not to get it wrong. Of course they do. And um, they sort of put, uh, um, hey, well, well, if this happens or that happens, this might happen. And so and, and as a consequence, what, what I've tended to find is that you go through the year, and when you get to the last quarter, that's when the truth is out, because come the year end, there's nowhere else to go. It, the reality is what it is. And you tend to find that um, all the little things that are tucked away tend to fall out during the last quarter. And um, that's what I would have expected. Um, I quote Councillor Longley, you have one minute to go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, that's what I've expected, and I expect it this coming year as well. So, no issue there as far as I'm concerned. Um, accumulated debt, yes. Uh, you're talking about the maturity profile here, and um, what you'll find is, I've, I've got a, that, I'll show you the, the, um, the, uh, um, the, the profile. It's quite interesting. It's very, very low maturity profile for about 30 years, and it hikes up quite significantly due to two things. It's due to the housing policy borrowings. But also, when we were at NCC, we borrowed long uh, at a very low rate of interest. It's all fixed interest. And so you're effectively doing that to inflate away your debt. That's the objective. And, um, and that's what we've done. But I'd show you that. I think you find it quite interesting. £150 rebate. That's a Rebs and Ben thing. Can ask you a question, but I will find out. Thank you, Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, you've had an hour on this subject and so I'm now going to call a recess for 15 minutes and I mean 15 minutes because we still have a lot to get through. Thank you.
Come on, people. Yes, you're on. Ladies and gentlemen, please. We're running out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start with an announcement that I didn't make before we had our break, and that I'm going to ask Council uh, to receive the reports of the Cabinet members um, and the record of decisions from the Cabinet meetings held in December, January, February and March 2021. Are you in agreement, please? Great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll then go on to item eight, which is the SACRA annual report. Um, and I'll invite Councillor uh, Daniel Lister to introduce the report and move the proposal. Five minutes, please. Madam Chair, I'm pleased to propose the Standing Advisory Council on Religious Education annual report. You get to learn about other religions. It teaches us to respect other people. It broadens our knowledge of the world and other cultures in it. Things my daughter said when I asked her what she thinks when I say religious education. Since 1944, all schools have been required to teach religious education to all pupils on the school roll, and it continues to play a major role in the curriculum, enabling pupils to explore their own beliefs, values, and tradition, and become more informed about those of others. Religious education has never been more relevant, engaging, or challenging. For pupils to be able to understand our constantly changing world, they need to be able to interpret religious issues and evaluate their significance. From the pupil's first day at school, RE gives students valuable insight into the diverse beliefs and opinions held by people today. It helps with their own personal development and supports an understanding of the spiritual, moral, social, and cultural questions that surface again and again in their lives. In tackling difficult questions, it provides pupils with insight that can work to challenge stereotypes, promote cohesion, and tackle extremism. RE does important work encouraging young people to value themselves and the communities within which they live. It enables pupils to acquire and develop knowledge and understanding of a range of religious and non-religious life stances, and to develop respect and sensitivity so that as future citizens, they will value and celebrate cultural and religious diversity. Religious education also makes a valuable contribution to pupils' lifelong search for truth and meaning and is preparing the children and young people of Northamptonshire for adult life, employment and lifelong learning. And so I'm pleased to propose the report to Council. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask Councillor Fiona Baker to second the report, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to second this report. Um, it is something that we have a statutory obligation to support from our council and it is a way of all of our children working together with each other, learning about the lifestyles of all of the diverse children that we have in our district and I thoroughly support it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any members of the council who would like to comment on the report? No, none at all. Um, Right, um, that haven't been asked, have we? Um, Councillor Lister, um, would you like to, to respond at all? Have you got anything further you'd like to say? I, I don't think so, Madam Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, then we take a vote. Um, those in favour of the report, please show. Anybody against? Are there any abstentions? And that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Um, item nine, appointment um, of Chief Officer. I'll invite Councillor Mike Hallam to introduce the report and move the proposal. Five minutes, Councillor Hallam. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Hopefully I won't um, take five minutes because this is a fairly simple report and it's one that we're obligated to bring when appointing somebody to a senior office of old. The only point that I would make, so it saves any questions on this, there is no financial um, implication to this because the successful applicant to the post was also previously a director, so, so the pay stays exactly the same. So there's no financial implication and, um, to the, uh, to the no extra financial burden to the council. Happy to propose. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Kinder. Sorry, Madam Chairman, oh, please to second sorry, that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Councillor Patel, thank you. Thank you. Please to second that, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, are there any members of the Council who wish to comment on this item? None. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Hallam, anything else you'd like to say? Happy to move to the vote. Thank you very much indeed. Vote. Yes, yep. we're coming to the vote now, please. Uh, for, against, or um, abstain. Please all show if you're for or against or abstain. Please, for, against, abstain. It's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Um, item 10, safeguarding adult board annual report. Uh, Councillor Gilby. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So before us today, we have the Northamptonshire Safeguard and Adults Board annual report. And the eagle-eyed amongst us will notice that it's 2020-21. So it is quite, you know, quite a view back. Um, but it is a statutory report. And as a council, it has to be uh, put before us um, each year. The reason that it's coming to us quite late is purely because of COVID and the strains that it's put on officers and um, and the mechanics of getting the report to us earlier. But um, for those colleagues that um, haven't come across this report before, uh, the purpose of the Northamptonshire Safeguarding Adults Board is to seek assurance that local safeguarding arrangements and partners act to protect the welfare of local adults who may be at risk of abuse or harm. So it is a very serious um, report, and the, uh, I'm sure members have read every single word. Um, it is. Um, it does really bring home the enormity and the gravity of um, a lot of the statutory issues um, that we are tasked as a council to, to uphold. Um, it is compliant and it's one of the requis requisites of the CARE Act that we produce this report and that we have a statutory group and a board that meets and that board is made up of uh, key statutory partners including um, the police, the clinical commissioning group, and of course us, the local authority, and it, it does include myself as, um, as the member, and um, it does um, include Emma Roberts, who's the opposition member uh, representative on the board. Um, Stuart Lackenby is the chair of the board. Previously, there has been an, an independent chair, but um, we thought we would try Stuart as the chair. I think it's a, it's a good idea because Stuart is living the real-time experience of a lot of the issues that are coming to the board, but it also... Um, rotates and it's going to ro rotate actually it rotated at the last meeting with um, David Watts who's Stuart's, who's Stuart's opposite number in the north um, because obviously it is still operating on a county-wide footprint. One thing that has been put in place which I think is is very good is that we've got an independent scrutineer come to the board that um, really tries to hold the authorities to account, hold the officers to account and of course um, myself and and Emma, as, mem as, as the other member, we can try and obviously hold the board to account, but also hold the independent scrutineer to account to make sure that she's doing a really good and diligent job. Um, when things do go wrong, it's this Safeguarding Adults Board that um, undertakes the serious case reviews or the uh, Safeguarding Adult Reviews, they're known as in this case. And in, in the lifespan of this report, there were five of those um, events and they're bas basically when there's a there's a death that um, that really needs some sort of investigation and it looks into um, some of the issues that may have happened and some of the shortcomings of some of the partners and of course out of that drops a lot of learning that again it's the board's job to really make sure that any learning from any of these serious or safeguarding adult reviews is really embedded into everything um, that the partnership does um, in the different organisations. There are lots of areas um, 
uh, mentioned in the report, lots of areas of progress and good achievement throughout the year, um, whether it's um, whether we're talking about domestic abuse, mental health, um, and, and the issues around mental health, or how the partnership is working or not, um, you know, uh, together. So there's some really meaty issues um, covered in the report, and there's lots of subgroups as well. They do a lot of really good work that report back up to the um, to the board. Um, and of course, the report also talks quite honestly about um, some of the issues that it needs to get better at. Um, I think it's the credit to the credit of the board that it carried on meeting throughout um, the pandemic. It talks about 100% um, attendance from all partners, which is really important when, we've, when we're talking about strategic boards. Um, As, as I said, um, it, it met throughout the pandemic and oversaw a lot of work and a lot of the issues, um, um, especially around care homes that, that were safeguarding concerns and sought reassurance, like I say, um, to make sure that um, the authorities were acting in the best way possible. Moving forward, the Northamptonshire Safeguard and Alex Board would have a real key role as we move to the CQC, CQC inspection framework of our local system and the local authority from October in 2023. So it's going to have a, a real critical role in making sure that safeguarding and, and the issues that we're going to be inspected on are being, um, are being accounted for in, in the right way. And I have to say, finally, as a member of the board, I've been impressed with the commitment and the diligence um, shown from all partners and everybody on the board to ensure that the board is being as effective as possible. And I know, talking to Stuart, he was very, very keen. Some of the, some boards can get a bit too strategic, a bit too talking shoppy, but we've really got to, this is another one of those boards, like the Health and Wellbeing being poured where, you know, what's the point of all sitting around chatting, saying everybody's doing a great job? We've got to make sure these boards are effective, uh, as effective as possible to make sure they're doing the job that they're tasked for, coming back to the statute, statutory duties that we as a council are tasked for, uh, tasked for providing. So I'm very happy to um, present the report to council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cooper, a second, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm very pleased that we have renewed focus of the Northampton Safeguarding Adults Board. The board are working together to ensure that adults across Northamptonshire are safeguarded from harm and can live their lives independently and free from abuse and neglect. Working together to keep people safe is our vision for safeguarding adults at risk. We believe that people should be able to live a life that is free from harm for communities to have a culture that does not tolerate abuse, that Northamptonshire is a place where we work together to prevent abuse, and where people know who to reach out to and what to do when abuse happens. Reading the annual report and the strategic plans progress made during the last 12 months, we can see that the board has worked hard to provide effective local leadership on safeguarding adults to ensure people are safe particularly during the period of transition from the County Council to the new unitary authorities. There have been continuous development of the NSAB to ensure the board's key priorities and objectives are delivered by the partnership. To make the NSAB's vision a reality, everyone needs to work together involving the person who is at risk, their families and all the agencies across the partnership. Our strategic priorities drive this joint working and partnership. I look forward to their continued progress. I'm pleased to second the report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Um, can I call on Councillor Sally Beardsworth, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the report is very informative and also very worrying when you read the case reviews that has, are actually highlighted in the report. But my, my worry is now that, you know, we've got I issues of cuckooing, We've got various issues of other safeguarding issues. And, of course, the big one, which is the increase in uh, the fuel and petrol crisis, because that's going to hatch, actually hit old people and people living alone very, very hard. So I'm just hopeful that the Safeguarding Board will look at that as well, because I feel that there are going to be more people that can't live with the pressures 
that are on them today with uh, the increase in living allowance, living and actually the keeping warm and looking after themselves. I mean, they were saying things like people are just going to have one shower a week. Well, that isn't good for your health. And it's definitely not good for your health not having your heating on when it's freezing cold. We've got to actually look at some of these things and see as a council what we can do to help these people. So I'm pleased we've got the safeguarding board and I do, I do recognise they do tremendous work. But I think it's going to be a lot worse in the future months and years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the report. Um, I have a privilege of sitting on the board, and one of the things I've, I've experienced, because it's a, been a huge learning curve for me, is how much experience the people on there actually have and how dedicated they are to ensuring provision of service, but also how open they are to admitting when things have gone wrong um, and how open they were to accepting that things weren't quite there and lots of work was still needed to be done. And I found that refreshing because I hadn't really experienced that before. Um, so I wanted to commend them for, for doing that. The, everybody will have read the report. It has, has some really frightening um, statistics and I hope that the board as a partnership are able to move forward um, in the coming year. I, I really hope that as a local authority, we become the, the linchpin of that and we really do make sure that we are providing proper service, the correct provisions and that the, the SARS that are presented aren't happening again. Um, one of the, the things I get queries about a, a lot is, is um, voluntary carers or family carers and those who are providing support. And I thought it was interesting that the report showed 54% of reports were around neglect. And I wondered whether or not we, we really thought about the level of impact or the, the level that is measured by as to how, how the carers are actually feeling and how people are, are feeling such pressure from either personal or financial circumstances. Having been a, a carer for my mother, um, I, I know only too well how difficult that can be, and I had support. So um, I, I really hope that, again, the board and the, the authority um, looks at that really closely. But I want to thank all those involved in the report and hope that we see lots of learnings from it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stone, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for a really informative report. On page 131, it talks about the delivery board focused on members, operational activities, and so on, and it references domestic abuse, suicide prevention, and so on. I don't understand what it means, the delivery board focused on. I don't understand, um, in reality, you know, what difference that's made. So I'd, I'd quite like to understand that. Um, I'd quite like to understand, you, you say there's been three, only three referrals for a SARS in, in the relevant year. That doesn't seem to me to be, given, given what is going on, uh, all the things that uh, Councillor Beersworth referenced, cuckooing, um, increase in poverty, increase in neglect that was found during the pandemic where uh, a man was found on the floor because he hadn't eaten for four days. Another uh, man was found without any bedding, without a bed, without any floor covering, without any clothes that didn't have holes in because he'd been too proud to ask for help. Where are these cases coming through to the safe guarding board? Uh, we've had over the last five years a number of deaths on the street, um, rough sleepers dying, and there was one very notable case who, who I'll just call S, a woman. I am very, very surprised that none of those cases have uh, come through the SARS reviews, and I, I would like to understand a little bit about why that is. Um, We've got a good section here about the police. It's really important for us to know where the police are putting their resources. Thank you, Councillor Stone. You have one minute left. Thank you. And, and what their contribution to this is. But we also have a national picture uh, that's showing us that there are issues within the police about how they approach these kind of issues. So I think we would like some, well, I would certainly like some reassurance that our police force has been honest with themselves and have identified within their own force 
where extra training and extra support for um, personnel uh, has been required. And then, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Golby, would you like to respond to the debate? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the comments. And there are obviously some very, by the nature of what we're talking about, it's all extremely um, serious and a lot of it very, very concerning. And um, I'll take away the points made about um, cuckooing and, and Sally mentioned the pressures on costs and, and you know, the, the challenge for the system is to make sure people don't fall between the gaps. And I think that's one of the issues that has happened historically, really. And we've got to make sure as a partnership when people present at hospital and they're presenting uh, to the police and you know they're on the radar of the local authority people don't get missed and I think some of the learning from what I've seen um, involves that's that sort of issue so so that is really point and a very valid point and Emma mentions the dedication the openness and honesty of people and that's what I've picked up and we can challenge the police um, on perhaps Danielle's point there and, and maybe a, a, maybe the the police um, panel is a, is a question we could we could ask that um, ask that question as well. Uh, the deaths on the street and, and the cases that um, Daniel mentions, I will have those looked into and see if there's anything we can find out. They may well come to the next year's report, or they may well be they may be well be live as well. But um, I will I will check those issues and um, and come back to Danielle through um, Stuart um, the chair. But other than that, so I thank everybody for their comments and recommend the report to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We now come to the vote for, against or abstain. Those in favour? Thank you very much. Anybody against? And any abstentions? It's passed. Thank you. We now come on to item 11, which are motions. Motion 1. Uh, this is by Emma Roberts on fair trade. Um, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I have the pleasure of proposing this motion which seeks to embed fair trade into what West Northamptonshire Council does. You heard from a speaker earlier that we, Northampton had previously committed to being um, a fair trade town. Unfortunately, membership and support for that doesn't appear to have continued. So I would urge the, the motion for the whole of West Northamptonshire. It's incredibly important motion showing support to all our local businesses and organizations who already offer fair trade products. Farming is the sing single largest employer in the world, providing jobs and livelihoods for 40% of the population on earth. It's the largest source of income and jobs for poor rural communities. And yet many farmers and their families are going hungry. Workers are not receiving a fair wage and are denied labour, economic, social, civil and political rights and are denied freedom of association, collective bargaining rights and health and safety standards. Put in purely economic terms, we have market failure. Put in purely social terms, we are failing the poorest in work. Put in purely environmental concerns, by our inaction, we are favouring unsustainable farming practices. I think this motion sits at the heart of the sustainable strategy and pathway that this authority is proposing to be so committed to. There is an answer to all of those points I made before. That answer is fair trade. Fair trade offers price stability, a modest but essential correction to the market. Fair trade ensures an extra payment for farmers so they can invest in the future. Fair trade improves the environment through strict rules on pesticides, water conservation, soil erosion, GMOs, biodiversity, energy use, and reducing carbon footprints. It's perhaps no surprise that faith groups have been the strongest advocates for fair trade, given that the people and the planet are the heart of those movements. Churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and other places of worship have committed to supporting fair trade products using fair trade tea, coffee, sugar, and other items for events. I hope that we're able to follow in many of the uh, footsteps of faith groups in West Northamptonshire. Now, I won't pretend that the actions of West Northampton Council will by itself make a significant difference, but our contribution here will make some difference. And supporting the fair trade movement in West Northamptonshire, we can make an even bigger difference. Change doesn't actually always need to be revolutionary. It can be incremental, and dare I say it, conservative with a small c. 
offers a resource to such sustainable, worthy projects must be available. We cannot reject relevant, worthwhile and key items because we shy away from implementing accountability processes, which this motion does. Which is why the line is key within the report that officer support is there. I note, however, no amendments have been proposed by the administration, but we have two speakers. I fear that that might pose a problem for us. I hope it doesn't, and I hope they're speaking in support. I propose and commend this motion to the um, council, and I hope it can receive cross-party support. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask Councillor Winston Strachan to second the motion, please? Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I will second. <coughs> excuse me. I will second this motion. But before I do, I would like to say a few words about Fair Trade. It is a system of certification that aims to ensure a set of standard that a set of standards are met in the production and supply of product and ingredients. For shoppers, it means high quality, ethnically produced product for farmers and workers. Fair trade means workers' rights, safer working conditions, and fairer pay. Please believe me when I say I know what I'm talking about. Over the years, I've, I have witnessed the demise of the Windward Island banana industry as a result of unfair trading. I want to reach out and to appeal to conservatives on this council to support this motion. I want to suggest that the principles behind fair trade are ones which conservatives can support just as much as those of my Labour colleagues. Those who benefit from fair trade are nearly exclusively small-scale businesses, men and women. Fair trade supports smallholders trying to compete against the often tax-avoiding multinationals with little regard to the environmental effect of the businesses. Fair trade gives help gives a helping hand to the small business owner. Buying fair trade products and supporting fair trade products across our great county costs this council very little in practice, but makes a real difference Thank you. on the Council's ground. Thank you, one minute to go, sir. Thank you. In some of the poorest countries in the world. Finally, I know how important choice is to colleagues across the floor. This motion asks, the council, asks that council venues are asked to stock fair trade products in addition to other brands, giving people a choice between fair trade and non-fair trade products. What could be more conservative friendly than giving consumers greater choice? Chairman, I am pleased to second this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have a number of speakers. Um, we'll start with Councillor Adam Brown, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, I commend Councillor Roberts on her foresight. But uh, before I get inundated with the uh, predictable cries of shame from opposite the floor, uh, I would just like to point out that you know, we completely accept the notion that fair trade and the Fair Trade Foundation are vital uh, and worthy concepts. In fact, the first line of the motion, which reads that this council welcomes the work of the Fair Trade Foundation, to encourage the use of fair trade goods. I don't believe anybody in this council would disagree with whatsoever. Where we do reach uh, a practical issue uh, is with the actions being asked of us. Now, several of the items uh, contained within the proposed resolutions are already being carried out. Uh, the, uh, the council's food outlets, for example, would already meet the, uh, the definition set out by the Fair Trade Foundation in terms of the number of fair trade products that they stock. They, they ask a minimum of four. Uh, in, in their requirements to become a fair trade community. But the biggest problem of all is the, is the resolution for West Northamptonshire communities to seek to become fair trade communities. If you read through the Fair Trade Foundation website and their requirements uh, for that accreditation to be achieved, it would require an enormous and lengthy undertaking by officers of this council to go out and audit the, the businesses 
and the, uh, the commercial activities across the entire West Northamptonshire area. At a time when we're still deeply embedded in the process of setting up what will hopefully prove to be a successful and you know, fully functioning uh, new council, it simply isn't an appropriate use of resources to look at that level uh, of engagement in this sort of issue at this stage. As I say, I am fully behind the work of the Fair Trade Foundation. I choose to buy fair trade myself, uh, you know, wherever I can, you know, much like I choose to buy free, uh, free range eggs, uh, wherever I can. And so I commend Councillor Strachan's uh, approval of the, uh, the concept of con consumer choice. Now, you know, I'm more than open to, to having a conversation with colleagues opposite about certain items within the motion um, that, that we may be able to implement, such as raising awareness via the website. But the feeling uh, on, on my side of the aisle was that if we were to present a motion that whittled it down to what we could uh, foresee as being practical in the short term, that, then we'd fall foul uh, of the constitutional requirement not to undermine uh, the spirit of the motion. So, as I say, uh, we very much applaud the notion behind fair trade, but the, the proposed resolutions simply aren't practical uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Colin Morgan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, to echo Councillor Brown's point, I think there was a couple of issues here. Clause 7, Clause 8 and Clause 9 are problematic, um, particularly at a time when we've got our work cut out and other projects, etc. And we've seen that all through the evening. There's a lot to get through and a lot to do. Um, I think... As a, also, as a student of sustainability for many years, um, what, what you discover after a short while is everything is sustainability, and sustainability is everything once you start putting a tag on it. Uh, and I think the wider issue here is the fact that, as we've probably seen over the last couple of weeks, and it's going to really rock it, is food prices overall. With some quite scary predictions, even today coming out in the uh, the global news, up to 40% increase in particularly arable crops, etc., and even a lot around um, sort of free range eggs, etc., because of input costs of agriculture. So I think at this point in time, while the uh, while the core of it is laudable, of course, and I think who couldn't subscribe to fair practices, I think we also have to be realistic, and I think customer choice is going to have to come into it. Many people across our communities aren't really necessarily going to be in a position soon to weigh up one against the other. They're going to have, so in some cases, be very difficult even feeding themselves. There is some quite scary food inflation coming down the line. I think we need to know that as well, particularly in some of these products. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Beardsworth, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was a bit surprised when I saw this on the agenda because... Having been on the County Council before and the Borough Council, we've both had a fair trade, which we've actually agreed to doing. I, I believe Jonathan will remember we've actually passed. And because this Council has agreed to take any motions that have been passed at the Council, at the Borough Council and at the County Council, I naturally assumed this was a foregone conclusion and therefore didn't really need to be voted on because it's in the policy to come forward to us. Now, maybe they've added a few bits and bobs to it that you can't agree with, but surely, you know, as you said to me many a time, and Malcolm said to me, if you pick up the phone and we can have a chat about it, maybe we could have just taken seven, eight, and nine off, and that would have resulted in all of us being able to vote for it happily here tonight. Now, can I propose that we delete 7, 8, and 9 if the Labour Party is agreeable, and therefore then we wouldn't have to turn this very, very worthy motion down, but it also doesn't commit you to doing things that you can't see yourselves doing in the near future. But the policy already for fair trade is out there. It's probably not as concise as this one, but if, if the Labour Party are agreeable to taking seven, eight, and nine out, which are the ones you have a problem with, surely we can pass this motion unanimously because it is a very worthy one. Now, I don't know whether they will agree to that. It's up to the mover. But um, I just thought this was a foregone conclusion because we've discussed it both on the county and the borough, I think on the borough more than once, and we've always uh, passed it through, and we naturally became, thought it became policy at West North Hans. I'll leave you to sort out the details, gentlemen and ladies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh,
Mm -hmm. She could have done it before, but she can't make the amendments. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've just checked. Uh, Councillor Bailsworth, you can't propose change. Um, you should have done that beforehand. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call Councillor Dennis Meredith now. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was reading uh, this motion, although I'm going to support the motion because I believe in fair trade, but this is really history repeating itself. Um, I know there's a lot of new councillors here who, um, who wasn't on the borough council, on the county council, uh, when we discussed this. And it was the Labour Party motion that, that actually um, put a similar motion uh, to the council uh, a, a few years ago. And I was understand that uh, fair trade within uh, our councillors was still up and running. Um, I believe um, when I used to visit the Guildhall on quite a few occasions, we had fair trade coffee, fair trade sugar, and different items, and they used to buy it regularly. Uh, there used to be a shop in Northampton uh, that sold fair, fair trade. So I'm just wondering uh, why this motion had to be put forward when it's already, I mean, it's all the, the, the people, uh, the officers, there's still lots and lots of officers who, who are, are still employed uh, by us, was employed then by the, the Borough Council and the Old County Council. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, the fair trade uh, issue should still be up and running. And if it isn't up and running, then uh, surely um, we could ask questions of, of why it's not up and running. Um, also, I think what we need to do is the portfolio holder, I'm not sure what portfolio holder would actually, this would come under, uh, should look in to see... Uh, Councillor Meredith, you have one minute, please. Thank you. To, up. Uh, to see if fair trade uh, products are still being supplied um, by the relevant people. I mean, we have a catering company who supplies catering uh, for us uh, on, uh, for the town council. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, do they use fair trade coffee uh, when they serve it up in this place? So could the portfolio holder please look into it uh, and see if it's still up and running? Uh, and I think that would be a proper way to go, rather than putting this, this motion. But if this motion, if the Labour Party still wants to put this motion, I will support it. But as I say, uh, Chair, just to sum up, I am rather surprised that we're not using fair trade. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Zoe Smith, please. Thank you, Chair. I uh, wish to echo some of the comments made by some of the other speakers. This is something that certainly the Borough Council, having been on the Borough Council previously, was incredibly proud of, made much of across all parties. This was something that we held as a badge of pride. It does frustrate me sometimes that we don't want to celebrate what we already do, that the excuse for not committing to do something is to claim that we already do it. However, there is a real danger, if this isn't set in stone, that it can fall by the wayside. There is no guarantee here. There's no commitment to abiding by the fair trade principles. If we already do it because we've carried it forward from the borough, that's fantastic, but there isn't that protection for it, and I think that's a real concern. I think also it's really important to note that there are no points for saying that something's a nice idea or you're vaguely in support of it. We could do that without being councillors, without representing our communities. We are put in a position to actually put things into action, to support things, so we really, there is nothing for saying that something's a nice idea. It doesn't get you anywhere. As other people have mentioned, it is possible to look at, to have that discussion, to look at amendments to look at a way that this really important thing could have been put forward, whereas what we've actually done is to undermine our guarantee and our protection that this is something that's important to us and that we'll do. 
And finally, it is really tragic that the cost of living crisis that the, some of the decisions made and the inaction taken at a government level means that many things are unaffordable for people on a local level. But that doesn't mean that we should give up our priorities and that we should give up something that's really important and really necessary. Fair trade isn't a nice idea and a nice concept. It's Council a way Smith, of, life and it's a way of having meaningful action. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Jonathan Nunn, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. A couple of quick comments. Anything that was done at predecessor council, the borough or whatever, stands as policy. And until such time as we actively change that, I can give you an absolute assurance there's been no change since the start of WNC on fair trade related issues. But I'm pretty certain we've never gone anywhere near as far as this motion takes us. Councillor Beards will think is right. Probably seven, eight, and nine are the bigger commitments here, aren't they? I don't think constitutionally others are more expert, whereas, as you say, we can do anything about that. I think number six is a really important one. We have a workshop, cross-party workshop, on the sustainability and on my draft agenda to be discussed with the group. It's things like fair trade. It's things like circular economy, keeping money local and reducing the carbon footprint and enhancing the prosperity local. So these are things for that group certainly to, uh, uh, to look at. But, but, but an action, we'll check that last motion. We'll try and work out when that was. And we'll identify what the borough had committed to, which should be continuing. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I have no other speakers. Councillor Roberts, would you like to speak now, please? Thank you, Chair. So I do want to continue to, to bring the motion, Councillor Meredith, definitely. Um, we, we brought the motion under the full awareness that uh, the borough had considered it previously and that others uh, may well have done so. The Democracy and Standards Committee haven't yet considered the historic motions and I understand they'll be doing so at the next meeting. Um, that motion that was passed that Councillor Beardsworth that said that all those other motions should be considered, that hasn't been enacted yet. So all of those other motions aren't adopted unless they are fixed policy. If they were just a, we need to do this, they've not been adopted into into council business yet so you know that that needs to be clear um disappointed again because we haven't we might stock some products but that's one line in the document we haven't maintained our fair trade commitments and we haven't maintained um our fair trade membership etc we haven't continued to fulfill that so to say we're already doing it is not okay councillor councillor smith hit the nail on the head with with lots of things she said and i really thank her for doing so. We could have done this. Ambition and political will are there. It doesn't say you'll do this tomorrow. It doesn't even say you'll do this in 12 months time. It says you're going to implement the projects. And if you don't have ambition and you don't have political will and you don't have imagination and you don't have desire to do these things, then we're gonna keep failing in all these funding bids we're making and we're gonna keep failing our communities. Thank you very much indeed. We now come to the vote, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like you to vote for, against, or abstain. Um, those in favour, please show. Those against? Any abstentions? Motion, lost. Motion is lost. Now come to motion two, um, proposed by Councillor Zoe Smith, um, Youth Service Provision. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just want to say before I start that I've seen the amendment tabled uh, by the Conservative group and accept the amendment. Um, so our young people in this authority are hugely affected by what's going on in the communities and by political decisions taken in the authority. The fact that our key objective at the moment is to look at the climate crisis, to look at how we tackle the climate crisis. Nobody's more affected than our young people, and they desperately need a say in areas such as that. In areas such as education, youth provision, as mentioned earlier by some of the speakers, and the mental health services that are particularly affecting young people they really need to be able to have a say and to be actively involved with that. They also need to be able to understand the importance of being able to be involved in democracy and having an active part in democracy. So the youth politics organisation 
that works to engage young people with democracy, works to go on the principle of engaging, so engaging young people with the democratic process, education, so that we understand the importance of politics and the impact that it has on lives, the chance to debate and discuss the issues that are really important and to actually have a political say and a political discussion and to help young people with campaigns and things that they feel are important. What is really important as we work to engage our young people across the authority is to listen to them about what they actually want to see and what's important to them. You heard yesterday, you heard earlier today how eloquent the young people can be, how much they're able to have their say, and they're often more engaged with politics than their parents because they are actively engaged in education, they're actively engaged in these kind of discussions in school, and we could really do with listening to them. So one of the key things in accepting this motion is that our young people are the drivers of what that looks like and what shape that takes going forward. We can't speak for them, we need to hear from them what they think is the best way forward. It's also really important, as I believe one of the speakers mentioned, that this is a really representative and proportional cross-section of young people. There is a danger when looking at youth involvement that it tends, if, it's not, if we're not careful, it tends to be certain types of young people all of the time, people with a certain educational background or involvement that get involved, which is a natural um, response of where they're from. But it is really important that any youth movement that we have and that we involve, involve demographics from right across West North Ants. We need to be able to see young people of all kinds represented and we need to hear their voices. So I'm really pleased that there is an impetus and a motivation to engage young people and to listen to them and to engage the youth councils. But it's absolutely vital that we listen to the young people and that we let them drive that direction. And I hope that the council will support me in achieving this. Thank you very much. And I call <coughs> upon Wendy Randall, please, to second. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, happy to second the motion. Um, I do struggle with a little bit of the wording on the amendment, but if I don't accept it, that's the only, you know, it'll fail. But it's like we, we'd put, we need to engage with people, and the amendment said we will continue to engage with young people. I speak to a lot of young people all the time, and if I ask them if the council is engaging with them, they'd say, what council? Who's engaging with us? So I have a real issue with that. What I would, what I would like to see to, um, being done is that actually that you get in contact with the schools. Most of the schools have a school council. They could have it on their agenda, and they could feed in like that. A lot of the time, I mean, some of the young people I know have wanted things just like goalposts. And when I've said to them, come along and speak even at the town council, they don't want to enter that building. You know, they haven't got the confidence to speak like that. So, you know, we, we, we really need to listen to the young people, but we need to get out amongst them, you know, and truly find what they want, if that's what we really want to do. Um, you're saying here about youth parliament, and I totally agree um, with Zoe you're not always going to attract um, a broad um, to voice that opinion. So I just wondered, you know, and it's if they're going to come across to here, how are they going to get across here? You know, if you've got people the other end of South North Ants or the other end of the Daventry district area, how are, how are they going to get here? There's no buses. <laughs> and a lot of people haven't got any money. So, you know, whether you could do Zoom meetings or something with them, you know, so it's more accessible and maybe have Zoom meetings in school time so they can sit in school, um, you know, something like that. But, it, you know, it's key that, um, you know, that we, that we really do engage, we really do listen. Mental Councillor Randall, health you have is, one minute to go. OK, thank you. Um, I think if you go into any school um, and ask if they've got problems with mental health, um, it, every school has, 
you know, right down to the age of five, you're seeing mental health issues, you know, and self-harming. Um, you know, waiting list to see a lot of these agencies is a two-year waiting list. Um, you know, it's very sad. Um, and they just want to get out and do things, and, and things that are free. You know, exercise equipment with phone charges on, and, you know, there's loads, loads of different things that we could be doing, but we, we really need to be listening to the young people. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I should have gathered, ladies and gentlemen, the amendment um, has been received, and I call upon <laughs> Councillor Fiona Baker. Uh, Thank you, Madam amendment. Chairman. Um, first of all, I am slightly disappointed. And, but Chair, point of order. Chair, we've, we've accepted the amendment. Could you say that again? Sorry, Sorry we, we've accepted the amendment. Um, we accepted the amendment at the beginning of at the opening of the speech. So we've accepted the amendment. So the amendment. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, I think it still has to be. I'm, I'm instructed that it still has to be moved. Uh, by the amend by the amender. Substantive motion. Yeah. We've chair. We've notified parties in advance as well in an effort to engage as quickly as we possibly could to ensure speed of of business. Given I constantly here, we've got lots of business to get through. Yes. Um, it has to be moved by the amenda. By constitution. It has to be brief as possible, yes. yes. Councillor Baker. Um, whichever way around we're doing this, I just would like to speak on the motion. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. First of all, um, I'm sorry that I, in our break didn't come at a time when our young people were still here, because I did want to thank them for their input and uh, attendance here this evening, but fully understand why they didn't stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, the amendments put forward because actually we are starting now to see the light at the end of our tunnel in children's services, and we appreciate that our youth have been let down over, particularly over the COVID period. They have been shut in houses, not being able to get out, and it has affected them in an enormously big way. Um, the youth councils that we're putting together, um, we've already been working on that, and we have been doing for some time. Um, there is one that runs very well in Northampton, and I've been there many times, and all of those young people, as I'm sure Councillor Stone, who's been as well, will know that they do speak to people from the council. Um, we can go all around the world and find people that don't know about things, but there are a lot of young people who do speak to us. I visit two schools every week, so I speak to lots of young people at school as well. So it isn't true to say we don't speak to young people, but... We have very ambitious plans going forward. Obviously, we have a financial envelope that we have to work with, but we not only are we already putting in place, which we hope will be in place by September, the two youth forums in Daventry and South North Hants, so that they have a, a hub that's nearer to where they live, and they can vote for people to come together for our youth parliament, and we will find ways of bringing them into the building if, when that time comes whether we have to pick them up ourselves or send a bus, we will do it. We also are being really more ambitious than that and are embarking on a program of um, employing some youth workers to actually turn up in our parks across our district to engage young people who are in those parks to take place in activities. We have a small financial budget at the moment, so we have to start somewhere, but that's our first ambitious project that we're working on. Um, and I think that will be really successful because we need to aim this at older young people. We've got masses of things for, for small children to do. Um, in my own town, we've got lots of parks that are suitable for children up to about eight years old. After that, we run out of things for them to do. So this is our first bit of our, our plans, but we are always interested in ideas that people have got and how we can engage with young people. 
We are very ambitious. I'm very ambitious and very passionate about getting things for youth to do um, because they are our future and we need to in engage with them. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak, Madam Chairman. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor David Smith. Uh, happy to second. Um, just really to... To um, I think if, if that's what I'm supposed to be doing, seconding. No, but, uh, no, that's good. To be um, just so Councillor <laughs> Baker and myself have been working across port up across our portfolios on on this very subject, uh, and uh, we are fairly well advanced. Um, we're due to meet with the Northampton Association of Youth Clubs. Um, we're just trying to get a date. We're trying to get the the, the diaries to align is a bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, disappointed that Councillor Randall. Um, doesn't have the, the faith of our youth to engage. Uh, I think uh, many members in this chamber see engagement with youth often uh, and good and robust. Um, well, you may shake your head, Councillor Randall, but maybe you, well, you may be not going out there, are you? Um, so we are seeing uh, engagement with youth. Uh, we are seeing them stepping forward with enthusiasm and we are supporting them with the youth forums. As Councillor Baker has said, transport will not be an issue we will ensure that we can get the youth to where they need to get to. Um, we're wholeheartedly behind this. Um, we are steps ahead of this uh, original motion, but I think working with everybody in this chamber, we can do the youth the justice that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Councillor Smith, can you confirm that you accept the amendment? I confirm that I accept the amendment. Thank you very much. Um, are there any members? Yes, there are. Um, can I have Councillor Roberts, please? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, the point of order wasn't to stop you speaking, Councillor Baker. Very happy to hear what you, you've got to say. And, you know, I'm really happy to hear the ambition. Um, but the point of the motion, Councillor Smith, was because we're being told, and we do go out there, believe me, a lot, we're being told by the young people we speak to that they don't know any of these things that you're doing. They don't feel that they are being talked to about projects that are happening. And this is not specifically directed at you as an individual, Councillor Baker, because I do appreciate the schools that you visit. But they are telling us that they don't know and they aren't aware, and therefore it was necessary to bring the, the motion. And I wasn't aware you were setting one up in Devonshire or South North Dance either, so there you go. Um, one of the other things that has been communicated significantly with me is with regards to um, school involvement and school commitment to young people attending youth forums and youth parliaments, etc. And I would really urge um, Councillor Baker as a separate point from this, because this motion is obviously going to pass, that if yourself or the Director of Education could write to all of the schools and just tell them that the motion has been passed and perhaps encourage them um, to send people or to allow people time off to attend and engage in those processes. Again, not a critique of you as personally, I'm just being told that they're not allowed or aren't necessarily always being told about things like this from their schools. So really important to go. It's a great motion. It's a necessary motion. Our youth are our future. Um, we need to deal with children from babies to 18 and, and onwards. We need to make sure that the people that matter to the future of this town matter and are at the heart of everything that we do. So. You're going to support it, even with the amendment. Great stuff. Let's get it voted through. Thank you. Councillor Rosie Humphreys. Just to add very briefly that I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues give this motion our wholehearted support. Uh, and I'm glad to hear Councillor Baker recognise that our youth have been let down uh, during the pandemic. And let's not forget that historically they've had a very low priorities, so it's good to hear of the plans that, uh, that, that have just been, uh, we've just been informed about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Stone. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased, um, I'm getting the feeling that this motion is going to get passed, so I'm really pleased about it. And I will certainly communicate that to all the young people that I work with. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. Nearly all the young people I work with, so school councils, youth groups, all tell me that they're worried about three main things. One is they don't feel safe. They don't feel safe in school. They don't feel safe 
in their own streets, they don't feel safe in parks, they don't feel safe. That is a terrible, terrible thing to hear young people say. The other thing they, they tell me is that their number one priority is mental health issues, and they all tell me what those issues are, and it's horrible to sit and listen to it. And we have just had a report that says there are 50 incidents a month of children seriously self-harming, and it is above the national average. There is absolutely no place for any complacency in our local authority and across Northamptonshire when it comes to our young people. Now, one of the things I want to say is it's really important to involve the schools, but even more important is really good youth work. All the areas of the country, like Rochford, like Rotherham, like lo lots of different places, where there's been really, really troubled young people and significant amounts of child abuse, the thing that the young people have always said is that their place of safety, their person of safety, was their youth workers. Youth, really good youth work, works amazingly like magic for our young people. And I think it's really important, and I'm glad to hear, Councillor Baker, that you, you've got an eye on that and you're putting in some additional outreach youth work. It's really important. But in terms of supporting our young people... To become, only one minute to, go. to become leaders, this is what we're wanting. Young people who can take a lead in setting the youth agenda in terms of developing a youth manifesto, in supporting us in our ambition to become an excellent council. We need young people developing those kind of leadership skills, as we have seen, as you've seen, Councillor Baker, with the Youth Summit in, in Northampton. Things like that don't happen by accident. Having young people who can do peer education, who can chair big conferences, who can set their own agendas, depends on excellent youth work. And we need to make sure that, that we have that available when we have the youth forums. I don't want to see those youth forums chaired by members, frankly. I want to see those youth forums chaired by young people, supported by excellent youth work. And I look for really good outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Meredith, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I look at this, uh, this motion and I have very sadness in my heart because um, and I'm going to tell you the reason why. I'm going to give you some facts of life for you to take on board. Ling's estate, no youth club. Falkland's estate, no youth club. Lumber tubs, no youth club. Goldings, no youth club. Southfields, no youth club. Goldings, no youth club. These areas are all deprived areas where kids have got nothing to do. So what do they do? They set up gangs. They have knife crime. They have robberies, breaking into people's houses. And I call, I'm like a, a person calling in the wilderness, saying, help, help Talavera. And what am I getting? I'm getting nothing. We had, when I first took over a councillor, I helped to involve seven youth clubs. I was actually leading to get them set up. Proper constituted youth clubs. All gone. Everything. And now we had... I think it was seven full-time youth workers. Seven full-time youth workers. And they, they was based in Northampton, and they used to come out and help. And what did you do? What did the Conservatives do? You cut every one of them out. So there ain't no youth workers. There's nobody to go out there into these estates. I thank you, Councillor Meredith. You have one minute to go. Thank so you'd you. would like to round up, please. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we have... 
I've lost my track now. Thank you. Uh, we haven't got any youth workers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we haven't got no youth workers anymore to go out into the estates to get the kids together to help people set up youth clubs. So there's no, no thing. So this Conservative administration has got to do something. You've got to put money into these areas. You've got to get out and come and have a look. Come and have a look in Talavera. And some of you would actually be horrified. And I say that with a heavy heart. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jonathan Harris, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a brief comment. Um, you heard from Councillor Humphreys. We obviously support this very clearly. Uh, but I just want to make, make a point of fact. We've heard a number of comments about this being uh, COVID-related and we've let our youth down in COVID. Um, the Northamptonshire data from the YMCA, so the whole of Northamptonshire, has shown a reduction in spend since 2010 of 94% on youth. 94%. That makes the whole of Northamptonshire, it's combined data, it's not just for West Northants, but that's the 14th lowest spend out of 173 council areas. So please, can we not just talk about this being a COVID issue? This is a long-standing issue. Thank you. Thank you. The Councillor Zoe Smith, would you like to round up, please? Thank you, Chair. I'm really glad to hear the support for the motion. I would just really urge people to go back to the point I made that young people need to drive this if particularly if there's only a very small pot of money it's really essential that we assure that we're spending money on what the young people want us to spend the money on not what we think they should want us to spend the money on and again in terms of speaking to young people i have absolutely no doubt that councillors do get out and speak to young people that their voices of some young people are heard but i know from my own career, working with young people who've experienced mental health difficulties and severe circumstances of life, that many young people's voices are not heard. I've seen the transformation in young people who've come from really difficult backgrounds, come from involvement in crime, and come to discover something else through the engagement that we do with them. And it might be that the instinct is not to listen to those sort of young people, and they're actually the ones we need to hear from most. If you go into a school, you know the sort of young people who are going to come up and speak to you and engage with you, and I have to admit I'd have been one of them as a young drama student and a young activist in my time. But actually, those young people, as important as their voices are, we really need to hear from the young people who are not inclined to go up and engage, from the young people who feel so let down. We need to have a strategy and we need to think really carefully what our strategy is going to be to engage all young people, not the ones we're most comfortable hearing from. And I would really urge that to be something taken on board in the work we're doing. We can make things look really good, we need to know what the measure of absolute success is going to be, and I would urge that to be the spirit in which this motion is carried forward. Thank you very much indeed. We now come to the vote, ladies and gentlemen. For, against or abstain. Those in favour, please show. Those against? And any abstentions? I think the motion is carried. Thank you very much. Um, motion three, proposed by Councillor Rosie um, Humphreys in support of Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. Um, Rosie Harris, please. Sorry, Rosie Humphreys. Thank you, Chair. The Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is a private member's bill and over the last year has gained the backing of 140 MPs as well as hundreds of organisations, businesses and local councils. Nearby Warwick District Council is one of the 180 councils who have passed motions in support of the bill. Many distinguished scientists have also given their support. For any council that has declared a climate emergency, as of course this council did last July, supporting this bill is a logical and necessary step and demonstrates weight and commitment to that declaration. To refuse to do so would, I believe, be irrational and perverse, giving unhelpfully mixed messages to our residents. 
How could a council aware that the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, with one in seven of our flora and fauna facing extinction, possibly not declare an ecological as well as a climate emergency? Moreover, our council has now, albeit belatedly, signed up to the Net Zero 100 pledge this year and is aligning all of its activities and policies to the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Three of those goals relating to climate action, life on land and life below water relate directly to how West North Hants is going to make a meaningful and measurable contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, limit global warming and halt the decline in wildlife species. The latest scientific evidence is clear. We are now in the decisive decade for tackling climate change. The report of the IPC earlier, earlier this month gave a very bleak warning the world has only a narrow chance of limiting global heating of 1.5 centigrade above pre-industrial levels and is falling far behind on making the changes needed to transform the global economy to a low carbon footing. Overshooting 1.5 degrees centigrade is now almost inevitable, but the overshoot could be temporary and temperatures could be returned to 1.5 by the end of this century if countries seek to reduce greenhouse gas emissions drastically this decade. Were this climate and ecological emergency bill passed in Parliament, the Paris Agreement would be enshrined into law and ensure that the UK does do its actual fair share to limit global temperature rise to 1.5. West North Hans has pledged its part to, re to reach net zero emissions by 2030, and a pledge to support this bill would demonstrate that the Council is serious about tackling nature emergency as well as the cl climate emergency. Nature is, after all, more than just something lovely to look at. It is what provides us with our basic needs, most obviously food production. While there's not time to consider all the details of the bill, one aspect to highlight is its provision for creating an emergency climate and nature strategy. The measures in this strategy must be projected to have a positive impact on local communities, including those with a high level of deprivation, young people, we've just been talking about, and those who have protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010. The measures must include financial support and retraining to enable people to transition from working in high emissions and high impact industries to new opportunities and careers in the low carbon economy. Giving our support to these aims is entirely consistent not only with this Council's emerging sustainability pathway and the UN goals, our support would also align with the Council's anti-poverty strategy which rightly won cross-party support when presented to Cabinet last week. Put simply, it's going to be impossible for adults and children in West North Hants to live their best life, stay fit and live in sustainable housing in places which are green and clean with resilient communities without action being taken to stem the depletion of the natural world and to promote the low carbon economy. Northamptonshire is the birthplace of two great nature writers, the poet John Clare and the children's writer Dennis Watkins Pitchford. The linnets and yellow hammers described in some of Claire's famous poems were once common farmland birds that are now rarely seen in our countryside, today being on the Birds of Conservation Red List. Really, you're almost as likely to see them as you are the three gnomes in Watkins Pitchford's classic, The Little Grey Men. This Thank you, just one minute left, please, we can sum up. This bird decline not only is a loss to our local biodiversity, but they represent in a very real sense the canaries in the mine. They are casualties to a far greater and less visible losses, the less glamorous forms of life, such as insects, plants, fungi, lichen, in other words, the ecology which, largely unthanked, keeps us all alive. I propose this motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I call upon Councillor Jonathan Harris to second the motion, please? Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second. Now, I have to say we've seen a motion defeated tonight already, and I suspect if form follows, we could well see a second as no amendment proposals from the administration have been forthcoming. Both of these motions are entirely in line with the sustainability commitment and clearly linked to July's climate emergency declaration, a motion brought by the administration. The Council has committed to, committed to net zero emissions by 2030 and the wider area by 2045. I was disappointed to hear, hear the word virtue signaling or the phrase virtue signaling heard earlier on this evening. Surely we're all better than that now. Um, if we're to talk about that and we're to talk about using terminology like that, then making false commitments and, pro and proclaiming strate strategies, they're the very worst examples of this if there's no substance to them. I, like Councillor Roberts mentioned earlier on, am very pleased to be involved in the sustainability cross uh, working group 
But I, for one, will not take part in a talking shop for the purposes of vanity. This group must coordinate around and influence real action on sustainability issues. It is the administration's decision to link the pathway to the wider UN sustainability goals. Ducking the issues and kicking the can down the road is not acceptable and will not wash with the electorate. Furthermore, the administration does not have all the ideas or answers to these big issues, neither does the opposition. To be clear, a clear strategy needs to be set out, if it is to be a strategy. Goals established and all actions need to be linked to a core direction and they need to be fully aligned. In terms of sustainability for this council, that now means the UN 17 goals, the framework the administration have cho chosen. This will require difficult decisions and uh, no area must be left on the table. Please think for yourselves, for your children, your grandchildren, and vote to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you'll gather that an amendment um, has been received, copies of which have been circulated. So I'm going to ask Councillor Emma Roberts to move the amendment, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, happy to move the amendment, and I believe um, the Councillor's proposing will be confirming acceptance of that amendment. Um, I, as long as I get to speak on the sustain, su substantive motion, just checking, then I will just move the amendment formally. Thank you, Chair. We do accept it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bob per uh, Purser, could you second the amendment, please? Thank you. And Rose Councillor Rosary Humphreys, you have accepted, haven't you? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other members of the council who wish to comment? Yes, there are. Councillor Colin Morgan, please. Chair, may I formally speak to the substantive motion as well, please? Yes. So, Councillor Morgan first. So, Councillor Morgan first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was um, simply waiting to see if I was to speak. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, to, to, I'm sure howls of shame on you were going to reject this motion and uh, I'll tell you why actually and it's not because actually elements of it are not appropriate um, and that's both, both uh, elements of it. But basically um, as we've already seen this evening um, and this is not a hollow strategy, it takes a lot of work to actually move from words of a, any emergency, climate, climate emergency, ecological emergency or what have you into actual practical work and the, the challenge you've seen already, if you've read the reports, you've seen it dotted and weaved through. For instance, you've had Councillor Brown speaking about the, uh, the council house's stock and the improvements there around climate change. You've seen um, uh, Jane from Corn actually even recognise the, uh, the leader's report where we spoke about sustainability strategy. This, this hasn't been easy for a, a, a council to get to this position. It's not like we're a campaign group. And I think fundamentally some of these um, requirements that you're asking us to do in the motion are basically like a campaigning group. Having said that, and um, Councillor Nunn said this earlier as the leader, we, we do want to speak about this at the group. And I think the ecological emergency is a very good place to speak about that and actually decide on what needs to be done. But whereas I think um, the, the consensus was, as it currently stands, asking us to to write to this, uh, this group or that group or support this or support that um, is really taking us away from the main focus, which is actually already operationalizing the climate change. And before anybody thinks it's hollow, already we've seen actually we have got the groups who've made the commitments, we will be out accountable to those. And also, the, uh, looking at performance issues, there's meetings coming up about actually reporting on the first year's performance. That's actually in my diary as the, the climate change person. And also, actually, keen-eyed members will also recognise that we put vacancies out now for sustainability project officers. Just one minute, Councillor Moore. Thank you very much, Ali, for concluding that time. But what my, my plea to you, basically, is this. We can declare as many emergencies as we like, but we'll be judged by the actions we're taking. And quite frankly, it does take quite a lot of time. You've also seen Councillor Longley's report talking about high, uh, high March in Daventry, 
uh, 1.8 million investment there, including getting it up to a good climate standard, and also EPC in his report as well, and that requires investment. There's a lot of investment, and we can chase like a campaign group, but we have to act like a council, and that's the challenge we've got with climate change. But we do want to talk about the, um, the, the first item on here, and we're prepared to talk about it in the group. We'd like to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Morgan, as local government, we have an absolute duty, not just we need to, we have an absolute duty to campaign for national policy change, where national policy change is needed to make it work for our communities. In fact, at one of the earlier council meetings, this council said we did need to call on government to overturn a decision that it had made because this council didn't feel it was right. So if this council thinks that these things are needed, then we absolutely could have done that and it wouldn't have taken much time and it wouldn't have taken significant officer time to actually carry out those activities. So I, I agree with, with Councillor Harris. This sustainability working group can't be, well, it's a cross-party working group, you know. Cross-party, they were all involved. You've got to be listening to the people and you've got to have and be prepared to, to hear their ideas. Again, sad week for sustainability when you vote things down like this just because it's not yours. And that's how it feels, I'm afraid, um, with these items. So I do hope we debate it at the, the working group. And, and I do appreciate um, Councillor Nunn's commitment to trying to make that a decent working group. And he's given me those reassurances. But very disappointed that you won't be supporting the motion and the, the Labour group will be. Thank you. Councillor Zoe Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. I want to echo some of Councillor Roberts' comments, but also we are dealing with everything that Councillor Humphreys laid out to us. We've got really terrifying ecological situation, and I'm not yet seeing the impact of any climate strategies being at the heart of every committee that I'm involved with everywhere that I sit. I'm not seeing the climate emergency brought up at every moment. And we have got sustainability strategies. And whilst I recognise the complexity, they do feel to be all over the place. It's not coherent. It's not joined up. It's not one vision. We had a report earlier in the evening that uh, made reference to several sustainability strategies being in various stages of development. Well, when we were looking at a really crucial emergency. We need to hear more details. We need it dealt with in much more detail at different stages. As Councillor Roberts mentioned, I don't think that writing a letter is going to take up significant officer time that we can't spare when we write loads. I, don't, I think, we've, as Councillor Roberts also mentioned, we're very good at press releases. There's lots of things that we could do. And we're not just a campaigning group, it's up to us to put the action behind it. And declaring an ecological emergency brings with it commitments that will strengthen what we're doing for the climate emergency. And it's absolutely vital because we... I remember being at one of the borough's early climate meetings and being really heartbroken because one of the young people there, probably about 14 years old, made the comment that I've heard Thank you, so Councilor many Smith, you have one minute to go. made the comment that I've heard so many people use over my lifetime and bearing in mind first acknowledgement of the climate crisis started around about the time I was born the real acknowledgement of how severe it was he talked about leaving a planet for his grandchildren and I had this realization that actually he's out of time it's the sort of the majority of the young of the councillors in this room might be talking about leaving a planet for the grandchildren. I'm look, thinking about leaving a planet for my children, and that young 14-year-old lad is actually looking at whether he's got a planet that's safe and sustainable to grow up on when he's older. And we're actually out of time, and that's why really committing to things like that is so important, and we can't duck out of it because we're playing political games, and that's why people cry shame. It's a bit of a game. It seems like a bit of a party trick to say, but actually it's because 
we're looking at whether that 14-year-old boy has a future. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor <laughs> Adam Brown. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I wonder how much is known within this chamber about the Climate and, Eco and Ecological Emergency Bill. Um, I wonder, in fact, how much even the proposer and seconder know about it, given that this motion is a copy, paste and fill in the blanks job uh, from a campaign website. For those who are unaware, the Climate and Ecolo Ecological Emergency Bill is a bill put forward by uh, Caroline Lucas of the Green Party as a private member's bill. Councillor Humphreys hit the nail on the head by, when she said that we don't have time to consider all aspects of the bill. We don't. It's a parliamentary bill. Of course we don't have time as a council. And in fact, even Parliament hasn't debated the details of this bill. It's had a first reading and no further debate. And it probably won't ever get a second reading. This is a non-bill that even Caroline Lucas seems to have lost interest in. The last mention of this bill on her social media was in February of last year. This simply isn't happening, and yet we're being asked to waste time debating a bill that's before Parliament but won't go any further. If we wanted to do favours to the environment, we, we, we would have deleted this motion and been able to turn the lights off in this room 20 minutes earlier. Councillor Purser, please. Chair, through you, I think this shows, the, the debate here shows why tackling climate change is difficult because it involves a change in attitudes and behaviour from all of us. And we haven't quite got it yet. We haven't understood the seriousness of the situation and the urgency of change. We saw it internationally. We can see it nationally and we can see it locally. And we have a task, and it's a task that I hope the sustainability group will address. How do we take it seriously? What do we have to do in terms of our own attitudes, the way we approach things, the way we get split between different parties trying to make political points about it? We've got to work together to save the planet that in our children's lifetime is in danger. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Beardsworth. Thank you, Chair. Can I first of all say I really resent um, Councillor Brown's assumption that my fellow councillors don't do their homework, because I can assure you they do and they're very knowledgeable on the subject as they have written this. And I really think it's unfair of you to say that because they're both very knowledgeable people on the subject. Now, if we are at all serious about climate change and ecological issues, I think we, all, we ought to invite your um, MP, Andrew Lewin, here. Because he's actually done an awful lot of work on this. And he was telling a colleague of his who told me that if we don't do something about climate change and we don't do something about ecology, that in less than 50 years, the continent of Africa will not exist as it is today. And we will have full-scale immigration from those continents to come here because there will be famine, there will be drought, there will be all the things that climate change will bring. What we do here today has a huge effect on other countries. Not on us so much, but other countries. And you might say you don't care, but you will do when they're knocking on the door saying, come in. And we can't send them all to Rwanda. We can't. They haven't got the space. So um, we have to make sure that there's something in place to make... We need to be... We need to be educating our children to look after things. I feed the birds in the garden, and I really enjoy watching them all come down. But there's not as many birds today as there were 20 or 30 years ago. There isn't. And this is what happens. Things gradually die out. 
and it has a huge effect on the environment. Thank you, Councillor well. Bedsworth. One minute. One minute ago. Yes, Thank I've you. got you. Uh, so basically, first and foremost, please don't decry my councillors because they do a damn tight lot of work on these issues. And if you're not prepared to accept them, that's your business. But in 50 years' time, when you're reaping the rewards of all this, and your children are facing this situation, just talk to Andrew Lewin, and he will tell you. And I really think you're being very, very short-sighted on the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nunn. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Let's wrap up quickly. I uh, agree with many of the comments, Councillor Brown and Councillor Morgan. However, I think there's a lot in this motion with merit, and I accept many of the uh, parallels that Councillor Humphreys has drawn with the other things that we identify as priorities. That's absolutely right. We're serious about this group, we really are. Our proposal is to circulate a, a, a draft agenda, including what we think our work plan should be, so that advance of that, people can chip in ideas, we'll thrash it all out, flip charts, that kind of stuff, and come up with what our work agenda might be. And I absolutely think there might be some stuff from this. Uh, I'm perhaps a little closer. I haven't got my group there yet in terms of agreement to this for the reasons that you've heard. But we can thrash through the issues in the group. I promise you that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Humphreys, would you like to sum up? So, Morgan, it's not uh, howls of shame. It's cries of incredulity, to be honest. Um, this evening, uh, your administration is rejecting not one but two motions which would have given uh, opportunities for leadership and, and real authenticity in what actions, progress you've taken so far as regards tackling climate change. I, I feel it's a real kick in the teeth for all those impacted by air pollution in our towns and some of our villages and those who are at risk by proximity of Northampton General Hospital from congested and polluting traffic and, and a kick in the teeth for our very fragile ecological balance in, in, in the whole of our area. Um, I, I believe your decision is completely inconsistent with what we understand so far of our um, sustainability strategy. Uh, I mentioned the anti-poverty strategy as well. Um, all you're required to do, it's, it's, it's not being a campaigning organisation. 180 council, councils have had the vision and imagination to uh, to, to, to support this bill, and I'm not going to rise to the bait of Councillor Brown's cheap points. Um, and uh, you know, th th there wasn't much to ask, really, so it it's deeply disappointing. I also feel for the environment groups that have been set up by hardworking parish councils in, in my ward, with many others, uh, you know, a message such as support for this uh, or the... Um, uh, the, the priority motion, uh, opposition motion, uh, I think would have given them encouragement, but we seem to be back to square one, quite frankly. Um, and I hope I'm proved uh, wrong on that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We now come to the vote, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, against, and um, abstention. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. All those against? Any abstentions? I'm afraid it's lost. Thank you. Um, we now move on to motion four, proposed by Councillor Sally Beardsworth, um, Ukraine, Ukraine refugee crisis. Councillor Beardsworth. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, just wait for people to settle down a little bit, the ones that are leaving. Um, can I just say, my first and foremost is a, a tremendous and humble thank you to all the people that have asked to have a Ukrainian family come and stay with them as their host, um, to look after them for six months of their lives, to, people, to total strangers uh, who probably haven't got a very good grip of English as well. I think they are tremendous and we should be wholeheartedly supporting those people um, during this time. No, nobody I know agrees with what Putin is doing um, regarding the Ukraine. I think it's a terrible thing that's happened. Watching the television every day, and I do watch it because I think it's essential to keep yourselves up to date, when you see people's homes totally destroyed, 
You see people living in basements for weeks on end with hardly any food and water. You see people, Russian soldiers, coming in and allegedly raping uh, women, children, executing men with their hands tied behind their backs. These are terrible things and should never be happening in the 21st century. It should never be happening. And I just can't understand, I can't totally understand where the Russians are coming from. But that aside, we've had several amendments to this motion. And you'll have to forgive me because I'm trying to integrate them in. It's a bit like a knitting pattern. Um, but I will try and stick to the, um, the amendments which I accept because I want whole, whole party agreement on this motion because I think it's very important to send a message out to the people that are making sacrifices in their lives, both on the English side and the Ukrainian side that are coming over here. Today we heard of several families that have actually put their names down to have families come and stay and they haven't heard from the Home Office for three or four weeks and they don't know when they're coming or what they're doing. And I think this is a terrible indictment on what's happening in our country, that we can't sort something out as simple as getting somebody across into our country into a safe haven. We really wanted a, some money put aside, but we've decided that the administration says there will be money if they, it's needed, because people will need help. The host families have got people living more than six months. We've talked lengthily about the increase in um, food, extra petrol, and we're giving them £350 a month, which is fine for some families, but others, they might find it struggling. So we really have to keep an eye on that, that people aren't going to go into financial difficulties by opening their homes up to the Ukrainian refugees. We need to set up organisations such as a volunteer base so people can take uh, von, um, the Ukrainian refugees to places of work to take them out for the day, to give the host families a break. We need to take, take them to teach them English. We've got teachers that have spoken to us that are quite prepared to give up their free time to teach the children English and, and their parents if necessary. The Ukrainian people are hardworking people. They want to come over here and fit into society, work hard, and let's face it, we need people to come over here at the moment. We're so short-staffed in a lot of areas, and that way we can actually, they will con contribute to society and pay their way. It, they said that they've come to th for three thank years. Thank you, Councillor Beardsworth. You one have minute. just one minute left. Well, if you'd like to wind up, please. Right, thank you. Three, they have three years to be here, but I don't think the Ukraine is going to be built in three years, so we might need to review that situation um, because I don't think people will be able to go back straight away, especially the women and children, to go back to the country that is completely being devastated. Watching it every night on television, I'm sure you join with me to think of the absolute horror it would happen to us if we went home tonight and our we found our home completely bombed out with nothing left, no sight of where our families are and how, how we'd feel about it. It's too difficult to imagine. And I think really and truly, I hope you will support, we'll have wholehearted support for this bill because we need to support all refugees, but at the, primarily at the moment we're, we're looking after Ukrainians, but all refugees that come to, from war-torn countries need our help. We shouldn't be shutting the door. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, call upon Councillor Jonathan Harris to second, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to second this motion. Um, we are grateful for the input from the Labour Group and the Administration in regard to this motion and the proposed amendments. Uh, and particularly grateful to the council leaders' intervention in the process to create dialogue. I have to say, perhaps this is something we'll eventually rub off on other members of the cabinet on motions. However, it has to be said, full engagement, again, was late in the day, despite this motion being in circulation for around two weeks. This is a general point, not specific to this motion, but where there are disagreements or different perspectives, Surely, we all have a duty to cooperate, especially on important issues. We will, of course, never agree on everything, as we do have different values and beliefs on a number of issues, but we can and should work together where we can find common ground. 
Make no mistake, however, accepting these amendments to the motion is a compromise. It doesn't go as far as we would have liked it to, but it's such an important issue that we wanted this motion to be in a shape that would receive wide and full support. That, I hope and believe, we have achieved through this compromise. But there are a couple of brief points I want to make in regards to some of the main items. One of the amendments, this is an emerging situation which we realise in time may require council funding to support both the faculties and the hosts. WNC will not be found wanting should this become the case. Well, we will be very clearly focused on holding the uh, administration to account should that be the issue. There was clearly disagreement on the wider refugee support issue, as there are many unknowns regarding the needs of those hosting Ukrainian, ho uh, uh, Ukrainian hosts. We also need to be aware of what those needs might be and how they might develop, and again, won't hesitate to push for further support should it be needed. I simply must implore that we press our MPs further. As uh, Councillor Beardsworth mentioned, we have regular messages from people who are struggling with visa applications. Four, Thank five, Harris, six Harris, you have weeks. just one minute to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are plenty of anecdotal stories about this being a core pattern emerging, and in some cases, the children's visas seem to be the ones that are slowest to come through, which holds the whole family back. This is just not acceptable. So please, can we lobby and talk to our MPs regularly on this issue? Finally, can I please request that there is a clear and regular communication between the council officers and those of us within our communities doing our best to support hosts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you'll all have gathered there is yet again an amendment uh, to motion. Um, so I call upon Councillor Jonathan Nunn uh, to propose the amendment. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairman. And um, I was really glad when I saw this motion come through. Um, I think it's really important that we send, uh, I would like to hope, a unanimous motion, a uh, message about Ukraine. I, I think the sentiments are pretty, uh, uh, pretty equally reflected across the council and indeed across the whole west of North Ants in terms of the horror of this whole uh, situation. Um, at, 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 I think two key parts of this are, you know, the idea of a particular figure was largely just about as yet undefined need. We, we, we do think that probably the government money of £10,500 that comes with each uh, evacuee uh, on top of the other uh, sort of provision provided will cover it. We don't know that, but at the moment we have no way of defining what that further need uh, will be. What we do have, of course, is a lot of defined need from other areas as well, which as yet is not met, and through many of our local charitable organisations, the Hope Centre for one, and they make that clear. So we have to be cautious not to just come up with a figure for which we have no defined uh, need. Uh, and that was part of the reason for removing the, the number, but hopefully keeping the sentiment that we are completely committed to this, as I know councillors of all sides are. In terms of further undefined need, uh, and I'd, be, I'd really welcome some clarity around this. We talk about other members of the, uh, other people in the, the town's community who are refugees have never felt we're able to define that. We have consideration as to what the cost might be if we chose to run a building. I don't think we define well what the need is. And, and I think the opportunity for this is coming, and it's back to something I mentioned earlier. The 7th of May, when we start this discussion on localities, a lot of work will be done, which members will, to, to help us fully understand all of the localities, perhaps particularly in this case, maybe that's the town centre, but we need to really define what the extent of that refugee um, situation is beyond these um, high profile uh, Afghanistan and Ukrainian things that we've done. If we define that, and we don't mind if it's a separate piece of work, but we must at least start with identifying that there is some sort of problem. Uh, because the, the general idea, and even the refugee centre, uh, and an allocation of an annual budget just doesn't quite seem to define the need. Uh, 7th of May is the start of that process. Let's hope that we can uh, define whether there is or isn't such a problem. But in terms of coming back to the motion, uh, thank you for uh, the discussions we've had uh, to the proposer and seconder uh, on this. And we're really keen now that this is in a place where we would like to unanimously support this to show the people of Ukraine and their families that might live within the West North Ants community that we are right behind them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor David Smith, to second, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, as always, Jonathan's pretty much uh, nailed it. Um, community support, um, that, that was mentioned. Um, we've engaged right from the outset, um, and we continue. We've, we've engaged with the town and parish councils. 
um, faith groups, individuals, and will continue to do so. Um, this support is essential for the homes to Ukraine to work. Uh, the commitment, the, the, the wonderful families who've come forward so far, six months, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a massive undertaking. So it's down to all of us to, to do whatever we can uh, to support those people. Um, and I'm, I, I don't doubt for one second that every person in this building will do whatever they can. Um, please, we've managed to get the, uh, the, the uh, amendments accepted by everybody. Uh, I think Jonathan said enough around the, 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 the financial bit. Um, we've had a lot of discussion around the, the £10,500 per person and um, the, all the professional advice we've had, is it was felt that it would be sufficient. But as is detailed in, the, uh, in our amendment, should we be wanting, we will step up and ensure that we cover whatever we need to cover. Um, with regard to staff, um, we've got um, ads gone out to have six resettlement workers in West Northamptonshire. So I think, again, that shows the commitment of this council <coughs> to do the right thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm pleased to second this uh, amended motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Beersworth, can you confirm that you accept the amendment? I accept the amendments. Thank you very much indeed. Um, then we have some speakers. Um, I think we have Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Um, my group will be supporting the, the motion and I, I just wanted to convey um, also thanks to both Jonathan's um, and Councillor Beardsworth uh, for the way in which we went about this and that we stayed behind after Cabinet. We said we were going to do something and we did something and we've worked with Councillor Harris to, to get that done. I, I couldn't have been more disappointed that the, the money was watered down and the concept of a refugee centre um, and I do worry a little bit that we're still missing the point that this is about all refugees, not just about Ukrainian refugees. I'm not taking significance away from, from any group. Um, we have a duty to support. Um, Councillor Smith said at, at Cabinet, um, uh, I think he used actions to speak louder than words, we are a council of sanctuary. Well, we, we, haven't made, we made a commitment to become one and we haven't done that yet. So we still need to do that. So let's, let's do it. Um, and let's complete that and let's make sure that we're offering all groups who require refuge in West North Ants the support that they need, um, whether that be legal advice, whether that be a place to be, whether that be a place to eat, whatever it may be, we are that welcoming um, organisation. I just wanted to pick up on Jonathan's point. You've made quite a lot of reference to the 7th of May meeting and I feel like this is going to be a really crucial meeting. Um, I have queried with Democratic Services whether or not, given that it's about localities and communities, whether there could be a consideration for children to be allowed at that event, an allocation or childcare, because at 9 to 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning, believe me, any parent in here will know, that's not when someone wants to look after your children. So given the subject matter and all of the things that we're talking about, maybe we should give some consideration to that. But my group will wholeheartedly be supporting this motion and any support for refugees in the county. Thank you very much indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the bewitching hour of quarter to ten. Um, and so I'm not going to call anybody else to speak. Um, I'd like to take a vote now, please. A vote. Um, those in favour, please show. The amended motion. Sorry, those in favour, please show. Those against... Any amendments? Thank you very much. It is carried. Um, we've reached quarter to ten. And can I just read you um, what um, we should be doing? The business of the council meeting has not been concluded by 9.45. The chairman will draw to the attention of the meeting uh, to the time and to this rule. In the case of any motions or recommendations on the agenda that have not been dealt with and we have one left by a quarter to ten, then the chair must, must decide whether to end the meeting or to deal with the outstanding matter. And um, they must be uh, dealt with by 10 p.m. Um, 
We won't be able to. We won't be able to do the motion. <laughs> Um, I've been advised that what we can do is that we can hear the proposal um, as long as we're finished by 10 o'clock. Uh, would, you, would you like to hear Councillor Baker's motion? Point, point of order, Chair. You, you've cut off the debate on that motion at that time when you had speakers still ready to speak, speakers who work really closely with the refugee community. Um, I think it would have been incredibly prudent, Chair, to have allowed that speaker. Well, thank you very much for that comment, but um, as you well know, um, I am chairing this meeting, and that was my decision to make. Um, we have motion five, the final motion, uh, Councillor Baker, support for children, young people and adults with cerebral palsy. Uh, Councillor Baker, I've been advised to ask you to propose your motion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, I have to declare a, in, an emotional interest in this item. Those of you who know me will know that my son, who passed away last year, suffered from cerebral palsy from the day he arrived on this earth until the day he left. One in 400 births in the UK, 1,800 children die diagnosed every year. These are usually a consequence of what they call birth complications. Up until that time, we had, in many cases, healthy children. These children have this diagnosis for life. To promote the work going on already and do more. We undertake to put training sessions on for those in education and for Northamptonshire's Children's Trust, which they have asked for, in order to be able to support these children to live their best lives and support their families because for many this is a life sentence. There are many ways we can do this and we undertake to explore those by contacting Cerebral Palsy Awareness, Cerebral Palsy Northamptonshire to speak to families and professionals to build a good support package for these young people. We need to do more now we are doing work to help children and young people with mental health conditions. And although we realise fully and has been pointed out this evening that we haven't got there yet and we need to do an awful lot more, these young people with cerebral palsy have, been, have lost out in many ways. I'd like you all to support this motion to give our work at West North Hans Council in order to help these young people and families live their lives as best as they can and not just live their disability. I'm doing this short and sweet to fit in with the time allowed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we have uh, Councillor Lister, please, to second the motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't speak uh, long on this, or so I'd just like to say I second it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stone, we have time uh, for people to make comments. Councillor Stone. On this, on this motion, I wanted to say two things. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak on this one. I had an awful lot to say on the previous one, I have to say. What I wanted to say on this one is I don't ever agree normally with the administration putting forward motions. They don't need to. They've got the power, they can do whatever they like. On this particular motion, I really, really welcome it. It's been presented by somebody with expertise in this area, with lived experience in this area, and I think it's a really important motion because it's asking for us all to become much more aware of all the issues so that we can further support the children and the families and so I just wanted uh, the members to be aware of that. I don't think it's usually appropriate for the administration to bring forward its own motions. 
In this case, I think it was very well done, and I would like to thank Councillor Baker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Very briefly, agree. Um, I do worry that the things in there haven't and aren't already being done, but I think the sentiment behind the motion is right there. I think the concept of making sure we are all fully aware of what we need to do is important before this council, and my group will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Beardsworth. I totally support the motion, who wouldn't have, have dealt with their scope many times in the past, and I realise the essential work that they do. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can we take a vote, please? Those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Thank you very much for being so quick. Take this closed.